Welcome everyone to the sixth iteration of the ECAS Dialogues. I hope everyone is doing well today. I'd like to remind everyone that this meeting will be recorded. Uh, please keep your video off and mute your microphone for now. In this extraordinary dialogue, two of Southeast Asia's Nobel Peace Prize laureates, uh, Maria Ressa of the Philippines and Jose Ramos Horta, of Timor-Leste take on the fundamental ethical issues for the future of ASEAN in a very first dialogue governing democracy, human rights, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and social media. It should also be noted that the third Southeast Asian Nobel laureate, Aung San Suu Kyi, is in a Myanmar prison. Their dialogue will be followed by a panel on ASEAN human rights, social media, education, and youth. We are very excited to hear from, from all of them today. Please note that the views expressed by the speakers do not necessarily represent the views of the host and co-host organizations. Now, before we continue, we are going to have a uh, short group photo. Uh, I would like to have all the panelists to please turn on your cameras so we can take a photo. Okay. Uh, okay, I think all of us are present. All right, uh, please smile, everybody. So, three, two, one. Okay, uh, we one more. Okay, oh, we got it. Okay, great. So, uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Oh, you can have another photo now. <laughs> we'll move on. <laughs> all right. So, uh, all right. So, uh, shortly, I will now hand over to the moderator for this webinar, uh, Dr. Bob Aubrey. Uh, Dr. Bob. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. <clears throat> and uh, we're going to jump straight into the dialogue. Uh, I'd like to uh, uh, just mention that Maria uh, Ressa is the 2021 Nobel Peace Prize laureate, and she's actually going to be doing her job as a journalist, which is to interview and to conduct a discussion with Jose Ramos Horta. Uh, and uh, I would like to mention also that she will, we will come back to question and answer with, with Maria. Uh, she's a global expert on fake news, and I think we'll want to talk about that, and uh, is writing a book that uh, we're all waiting for, is how to stand up to a dictator. Excellency Jose Ramos Horta, welcome. And uh, he is the 1996 Nobel Peace Prize laureate. And today is a very special day because uh, he has been prime minister. He has been president of Timor-Leste and is now uh, in the, the day of the presidential election for his return. Uh, and he's also been chair of the UN Peace Operations the Advisory Council for the Global Law and Policy at Harvard University, and has authored several publications, the most recent being Words of Hope in Troubled Times, which is very relevant today. Welcome, uh, Excellency. So I, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Maria. Thank you, thank you, Bob. Thank you so much for this great opportunity. And just say hello, hello again. Um, it is a, a crucial day for you and for Timor-Leste. You know, we are waiting for, your, for the results. And this is a time when uh, you, Shashan, Shanana Busmao has said that Timor-Leste's parliament is, that it is in, in his words, constitutionally illegitimate. So please tell us what is happening in there now and how do you feel? I just went to vote uh, this morning, 7 a.m. Probably was the first vote in the entire country. Uh, we don't know yet of a voter turnout in the first round, uh, over 70% or 80% voted. Uh, and, uh, among other things, uh, the, the big issue in this country is that A, the incumbent president, hopefully that he will be ex-president in the next few hours. Uh, in our political system, slightly similar to uh, Singapore, Fiji, uh, it has a bit more power, but the president uh, has limited powers. 
he is the one who swear in the prime minister and the cabinet. The cabinet is presented to him by the prime minister who comes from either the most voted party or a parliamentary majority. The president doesn't have any other authority but swear in the prime minister and the cabinet. In this case, uh, Mr. Francisco Guterres Wall, who is also president of Fretilin, uh, he never resigned from his position as president of Fretilin. The constitution is very clear in one single paragraph, one and a half line, says the president cannot hold any other political office. Well, he never resigned from uh, that position. And uh, while the charter of the party uh, also stipulates that the president has to be an active president, you cannot be two months or three months uh, without exercising the function. So he didn't resign from the party. He didn't exercise his function as president of the party. <laughs> so completely. Uh, and then he declined to swear in seven members from the Shanana Guzman's party and the two from another party in a coalition that was presented to him in 2018. Then a, a sequence of other violations of the constitution. Uh, this, so this is the, uh, the good thing is that our people take seriously the principles, the ethics, the values of enshrined in the constitution. And what I have said repeatedly, we might be poor, uh, the people might be poor, but it don't take away from them, even, you know, this uh, constitution, you know. Uh, and so that's one issue. But the other issue is that I think the absolute uh, absence of the government during the, the floods in 2020, 2021, uh, uh, during the lockdowns uh, because of COVID, and, uh, when I travel out of the town, uh, out of the city to the village, I was the first person, political person, uh, who ventured out into the rural area. And it was a very strange feeling that uh, I was like, you know, someone coming out from a, a locked city and escaped. Uh, the walls of a city, and the people were so happy to see me because. I, <laughs> so anyway, I traveled all over the country, never saw the presence of any government personality. Mr. Shanana Guzman, uh, a few months later, he tremendously active, bringing humanitarian assistance. So it was me, it was Mr. Shanana Guzman, were closest to the people, in their direst needs, COVID and. Uh, Floods. The government was absent. So in the first round, uh, I got almost 40%, 47% of the votes, and the incumbent uh, 22%. In any other democracy, I would be elected uh, already. But we have uh, this copy paste constitution from uh, uh, Portugal, which requires that a second round be held if no candidate uh, reach 50 plus percent. So we are, have this wasteful exercise of money, of time, getting people tired of the elections. So we might have a low turnout. But apart from that, I have to say, in spite of, uh, in the midst of the setbacks of democracy in Southeast Asia and beyond, we are a thriving, a dynamic democracy, people, uh, live up to uh, stand up for democracy, our media, civil society. Uh, and uh, it is imperfect, like most democracies are imperfect, but our, uh, I would say uh, at the top, except for the abuse done by the president and the government, abuse of the constitution, of democratic uh, principles and procedures, is still uh, one of the most peaceful, politically peaceful uh, country in Southeast Asia. Oh my gosh. Well, first of all, thank you 
thank you for that, you know, and, and hopefully you get a high voter turnout today. Let me pull you up broader because I, we have followed each other over the last few decades, you know, um, and I guess one of the things I'll start with some of your lessons learned for all of us here, because I think, you know, someone like you who was a revolutionary uh, for a long time was able to rally the international community. This is where we spent the most time together. Uh, Timor-Leste is, 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 the, is the, I guess it's the newest nation in Asia, right? So I was there when it happened. I grew to love East Timor during that time period when you and Shanana Guzmao uh, were, were really for me, fighting against very oppressive uh, rule. And you won. And then you became the diplomat, the top diplomat of this newest nation. Then you became a leader. And now you are embroiled in the politics. Let me pull it out first from the revolutionary to leading a state. Uh, because I want to get your lessons. Maybe if you can give one or two lessons that you learned from that transition. And then I want to then follow up to to Southeast Asia, to ASEAN, right? So what did you learn to say, please shortcut for us? Well, I was always a center left, not left left. I never embraced Marxist Leninism. I was the founder of the first social democratic party and I remain a social democrat for the last 50 years or so. For me, uh, the inspiring principle, the guiding principle is justice, is freedom, uh, not ideologies. And uh, of course, my uh, Christian upbringing uh, for many, many years in, uh, in Christian schools, uh, growing up, obviously, you were told about uh, Christian principles, which if you look at uh, the preachings of social democracy, they uh, overlap, uh, uh, synchronize uh, well. And that means social justice, dignity, freedom. So I was never uh, guided by ideology. I never uh, saw black and white, uh, like you know, all the virtues in the left, all the wrongs, evil in the right, or vice versa. I always uh, believe, uh, stay focused on what I do. I don't spread around uh, in terms of trying to do uh, everything uh, same time. You have uh, to, I always tell our people in the fight for justice, for democracy, we fight because we believe in these principles. We fight because of our faith, our belief, but we also have to fight with brains. You have a you yeah. can't fight with dogmas with demagogy. Well, you uh, so you have to be uh, super smart. Particularly the weaker you are, smarter you have to be. But uh, even uh, major powers they do not uh, use brains, uh, uh, flexibility, pragmatism. Uh, well, you cannot uh, bully uh, your way into domination of any society. Of the, they tried over centuries, they, that's what they did. And for me, the qualities of leadership is A, um, brains, obviously, to lead, you have to be smart and uh, you have to study, study everything from A to Z, but also with a strong dose of compassion, of heart, of humility. Otherwise, uh, uh, you know, a leader without compassion, he can be an extraordinarily smart individual. But if he lacks a heart, how can you develop policies that are embracing of minorities, religious minorities, ethnic minorities, of uh, people with uh, physical disabilities, uh, and, uh, the LGBT community, uh, yeah. who you resist, uh, attempts uh, at uh, stigmatizing people from their uh, choices. So it has to be brains and uh, a big heart. Heart to look at uh, the dispossessed, at look at the children, the mothers, the pregnant mothers, 
look at issues of uh, malnutrition and so on. That's my my founding or my the basis of my life. No, 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 that's that's fantastic to hear. And yet during this the last few decades, the world has significantly changed. So you said justice and principles. I think those are those hold, right? But let's look at you know the how democracy has been rolled back all around the world. Uh, right now, we've seen in Southeast Asia, for example, uh, all of the global standards show that democracy has rolled back in our region, uh, partly uh, enabled by the, the way our information ecosystem has changed, social media, that social media has spread lies. But let me, let me leave that for a second question. I guess let me ask you, again, as a key part of, you know, a key player in watching our region, how do we move beyond this kind of existential moment when Russia's President Putin has invaded Ukraine, when for the first time in a very long time, the free world, and I put that in quotes because these old definitions have also been challenged. And then I guess, that's, this is a lot of questions in one, just say, but you know, the global dynamics and how that impacts us and how we deal with strengthening democracy in our region. Please. Well, uh, we have to bear in mind that uh, democracy is uh, a belief, it's a process, and there are progresses, conquests, and the setbacks. Sometimes the setbacks come, uh, often they come from the failure of elected leaders from the conventional, traditional political party system, from the political elites with resources, with strong financial backing. They are the ones who succeed in getting elected and they don't deliver. They disfranchise people, they alienate people. And this happened all over the world. So the, the setback to democracy is of politicians' own making. The rise of uh, extreme right in Europe, uh, it is not entirely to do with the failures of democracy, failures of delivery, but uh, a lot has to do with, with it. A failure of the, uh, the, the, uh, the elites. Uh, when you have an institution like the European Union, that are enormously complex, overly ambitious when they decide to go for the political union. And of course, many uh, felt that their uh, identity, uh, their culture, their values, because some of the European countries are hundreds of years old. And then suddenly they feel uh, unelected uh, bureaucracy in Brussels ruling uh, sometimes at absolute to the point of re being ridiculous the way uh, Brussels was uh, determining uh, almost everything uh, like for instance just to see the absolute ridiculousness of it uh, uh, Europe doesn't produce bananas they import bananas from Central America the bananas have all to be the same shape same curvature you know, and there are some 20 types of banana. In Timor Leste, we have 10 or 20 types of banana. And only a few years ago, they uh, ended this, uh, this regulation about the shape, the curvature of the banana. So that's one. But at the, the same time, uh, the people who traditionally vote in the European Union uh, parliamentary elections, very, very small minority. People don't really care about electing members for the European Parliament that function in Brussels. But uh, in Southeast Asia, is the same. If democracies do not deliver, do not embrace, people are disfranchised for generations. Well, uh, then comes people like Donald Trump in the US, others in Europe uh, and in Southeast Asia who make false promises with the magazine, promise that we know they will not deliver. People will realize 
few years from now, after a lot of harm has been done, they realize that after all, these demagogues are no better than the so-called Democrats. Yeah, this is, uh, I will follow up on the, on that, the populism that has been enabled and given greater power. But let me ask you about ASEAN now. Um, you know, uh, I was covering ASEAN when it stepped in, in East Timor, back, back then, right? And it was, it was effective to a degree. There, there was leadership, but um, here's another one. In ASEAN, when Madeleine Albright was, was the Secretary of State, uh, it was we, Myanmar was brought in as a member, and the the idea there is called is enlightened self interest, right? That that we would help make dem democracy work by joining ASEAN, coming together, and that these principles of democracy would go. Well, the, the latest challenge to ASEAN in our own region is Myanmar, and yet I guess I want to ask you: How has ASEAN dealt with this? How is how, what will ASEAN do to remain relevant in this changing landscape? We uh, should not judge or expect too much from ASEAN in dealing with some challenges like Myanmar. Look at the way the UN Security Council has been unable to resolve conflict like Syria, uh, Yemen, and how this huge conglomeration of economic military powers went into Afghanistan. Uh, NATO and the UN were not able, they had to pack and leave. So let alone uh, ASEAN. What the positive thing I have to say in regard is, I was pleasantly surprised, but not entirely surprised with the leadership that the Indonesia took in regard to situation in Myanmar. I was uh, pleasantly uh, surprised with uh, Malaysia and uh, to my greater surprise and very pleased with Singapore's uh, position. And this illustrates that uh, societies in ASEAN and the elite, political elite, well, they have a progress in their views of uh, where ASEAN is on uh, uh, in regard to human rights, democracy, rule of law. Uh, so 10 years ago, or even five, it was unthinkable that uh, you'd have uh, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, Philippines, uh, uh, even Vietnam uh, 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 voting with a UN resolution at the UN at the General Assembly in New York. And how, yeah, so that is already significant uh, progress, but ASEAN, they are dealing with uh, other forces that have uh, their own uh, interest in regard to Myanmar. And that is India on one side, China on the other, uh, and then you have uh, the Europeans and the United States that are more or less not directly too uh, active. And now we have uh, Ukraine and uh, Russia, which I'm sure the military in Myanmar are very pleased with the development because it's completely overwhelming the international media coverage, uh, uh, distracting uh, the international community from uh, yeah. Myanmar, from the tragedy in Myanmar. And look yeah. how, how often we see Myanmar now mentioned in the news and the uh, yeah. The situation in Myanmar remains catastrophic. Uh, so uh, the only thing is, I would say, uh, I, I commend uh, Indonesia leadership, Singapore, Malaysia for doing what they are trying to do. And uh, they have to be persistent uh, and on this matter of principle. Uh, in this day and age, a military cannot come in. Uh, overthrow a government and then manufacture all, all kinds of charges against the elected leaders and get away with it. Yeah, no, that's that's fantastic. I think we have time for two more questions from you. Um, let me let me focus first on the technology that has transformed all of our countries around the world. Right, it has led to the rise of 
digital authoritarians. We've, for example, just seen Hungary go to elections. Uh, France is in the middle of elections right now as well. And Macron is facing, you know, great challenges. Uh, it's unclear whether he'll actually win. So you talked a little bit about, uh, about part of the problem is with the politicians. Well, populism now has been given a boost by the information ecosystem, which actually rewards it. And this was something I had said in the Nobel lecture. We live at a time when the world's largest delivery platform of news is social media. And yet social media prioritizes the spread of lies laced with anger and hate over facts, which tears our societies apart, which makes it much harder to govern, which makes it much harder to get the facts to vote without facts. You can't have truth, you can't have trust. So I guess the question for you, um, Jose is, you know, how do you handle this? What advice would you give to citizens in democracies like yours, it, like ours, in how we can elect leaders who will do the greater good rather than power at all costs? Well, it is an extraordinary challenge, opportunity for uh, good people any uh, area, whether political, cultural, religious, or uh, society in general, to spread the message of tolerance, the message of uh, inclusiveness, of social justice, etc., etc. They spread the facts, uh, but also an opportunity for demagogues, for uh, enemies of democracy to make use, and they make very good use of existing technology. And uh, we are moving faster and faster to uh, complete digitalization of the way we live. Uh, already uh, artificial intelligence, well, uh, it, uh, China is one of the biggest investors in artificial intelligence. In 2018, if I'm not mistaken, China invested $25 billion in artificial intelligence. And, uh, and many other countries are doing the same, although I think China is the leader now on digitalization and artificial intelligence. What does that mean? There are many positive uh, things that come out of that in terms of uh, medicine, science, uh, you can diagnose faster and effectively from anywhere in the world. You don't need a whole hospital near you. It can be done. And uh, But at the same time, those who have power and sophistication and they wish to do so, they control you. They know all your movements, everything you do. You no longer have a privacy. And they can destroy you, destroy a country, by spreading false information. Look, Myanmar used that uh, during right. uh, the attacks on the Rohingya and uh, the military together with their uh, supporters, they spread the false information. Way back during the Rwanda genocide, right. uh, before the era of internet, it was radio. Radio. In uh, yeah. Balkans, in Serbia, before the era of uh, internet, it was radio used by S Serbian ultra-nationalists, demonizing Bosnian Muslims and led yeah. to the genocide. So, uh, but today we have a much more effective, much more intrusive uh, uh, social media uh, that used by irresponsible element to, to destabilize democracy, destabilize entire societies. Um, this is, I think, part of the reason that we've had such a rollback of democracy in, in many parts of the world. And why we always say we have elections coming up on May 9th in the Philippines. And, you know, how can you have integrity of elections if you don't have integrity of facts. Um, I, I know your time is limited, so I'll ask the last question, which brings us right back to you, leader of your people, um, in terms of uh, delivering to the people. So you mentioned COVID. Oxfam actually came out with a report that globally, under COVID, the rich got richer, the poor got poorer. 
in the Philippines, the Philippines passed two legislation for COVID that helped the richest, but then the third legislation never passed, the one that would have provided some kind of social safety net. You talked about principles in leadership, but how do we, I guess, this is a, a group that was put together around ethics in ASEAN. Principles and ethics are combined to me, but it feels like part of the reason trust is also lost is because the principles are now completely torn apart. It's hard to hold leaders accountable to the people. And then the second one is, you know, ASEAN and ethics. When you helped form this with, with Bob, you know, do we have ethics in ASEAN? How do we do that in such a wide ranging 10 nation membership with such different values? Well, uh, obviously, uh, uh, in a region with 10 countries, with different political uh, systems, a different history, uh, it's very difficult to uh, have a uniform uh, thought, uniform uh, value that, uh, that maybe on paper people believe, I agree, but uh, uh, it is not going to be possible to always reach consensus, reconcile. Uh, that uh, because you have the identities, you have uh, the traditions, you have the happy <laughs> the, and the political system in each country. But, uh, and then you have the uh, perceptions of the way each leader think uh, what is the best for Russia, what is possible, what is not possible, all of that. Uh, so I would say uh, that um, uh, ASEAN has made, uh, has progress, like the region has progress. The region no longer, people uh, no longer accept military coups. They, you no longer see too much military presence in the streets. Uh, you, Indonesia is one of the best examples in that uh, uh, during the Swartu era, the military had opinions on everything and uh, they were in the uh, government. Today, you hardly hear the Indonesian military offer an opinion on, on um, matters that belong to the political elite. So, uh, and this has taken, I know, almost like you know, 50 years, 60 years of Indonesia's independence. And uh, uh, <laughs> so we have just to be fighting to improve democracy, perfect democracy as we've been fighting for decades, continuing understanding that, uh, that there will be setbacks, there will be triumph of democracy again. And, uh, and these uh, examples uh, exist everywhere. Like uh, I'm familiar with the uh, situations in Europe, familiar with said, Latin America. Go oh, and look at Latin America, what uh, happened in the last 10 years, uh, regression of all sorts. Uh, but then some uh, young leader emerged in Chile, for instance, yeah. 30 years, something old and very promising. And uh, so, and in Brazil, maybe uh, this September, new election, President Lula might come yes. back in power. So we just have to be uh, philosophical about it. Don't lose sight of what is most important and uh, fight when, the, but fight not with radicalism, but fight with uh, brains, with wisdom and uh, a, a great deal of humility. That's fantastic. Your Excellency just said, Ramos Horta, thank you so thank much you. for your time. Let me bring in Bob Aram. Bob, please. Thank well, thank you, uh, first of all, Pre and, uh, Excellency, and uh, looking forward to uh, the results today. Thank you so much. Thanks for your patience today. I know that uh, uh, the time has been uh, problematic. Uh, and uh, thank you for, for, for gracing our, our webinar. This is the second time. and. Uh, uh, the first time was on leadership, this time on the ethics of freedom. Thank you so much, and uh, best of luck. So, Thank you, Maria. Great seeing you again. And, uh, Wonderful seeing you.
Is there any message, uh, Ramos Mota, that you would like to leave with these young people? We have a lot of students from ASEAN today. Uh, is there anything you'd like to, to leave them with? Well, I would, uh, I would say, you know, when the crisis in Myanmar uh, erupted, I would call immediately friends in Indonesia, uh, Dino Jalal, who is the founder and director of uh, Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia. And I told him, listen, Dino, societies, elites, people in general in Southeast Asia must live up to that responsibility in regard to Myanmar. I call friends in the Philippines, uh, Gas Miklat and others. I talk to friends in Malaysia, in South Korea. And then we had a first major uh, webinar on Myanmar on 8 April 2020, the very day I had my first dose of the COVID vaccine. And I was going to do the closing in the afternoon and I was feeling a bit feverish. I didn't know the consequence of the vaccine. So I sent a message, sorry, I will not do the closing speed. Of course I was okay. And, uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, and so the message is only uh, to the young people. You want a better Southeast Asia. You want a better uh, region, uh, a better community that is generous, that is uh, embracing of everyone because Southeast Asia is extraordinarily rich in diversity, ethnic, religious, culture, <laughs> identity, everything. And that makes Southeast Asia unique. Then fight for it. Do not abandon the people of Myanmar who feel completely abandoned. And uh, that is an absolute priority for us in Southeast Asia. Myanmar, stand behind those so young, many young people, artists, singers, uh, civil servants, uh, even military people, police, they are now defecting. So stand behind them so they don't feel abandoned, betrayed. Thank you very much, uh, and uh, and best of us. Thank you for joining this 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 call and this dialogue. Thank you. Thank All right. You, so, thank you. And so uh, perhaps I'll turn it around to to Maria Ressa, and 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 ask you the same questions. Uh, not the same, exactly the same questions, but. Let's, you started with uh, Timor-Leste. Let me begin with Philippines. And uh, can, can you uh, give us your point of view of what's going on uh, in the present election? We know that you're engaged, uh, that, you're, 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 uh, that Rappler is, is also covering this very closely, but you're more than covering it. And with the uh, Nobel Peace Prize, it gives you tr a tremendous... Uh, I won't say celebrity, but you have a presence and people know. I, I've wondered if, I'm sure you've been asked to, uh, if you would enter public office, have you been tempted to em enter public office and to go beyond uh, the, 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 your, your present role? What's going on oh and God. what are you going to do about it, basically? <laughs> I should ask Jose, but Bob, first of all, apologies. You know, I, I had just interviewed Manny Pacquiao and I accidentally said Bob Aram. Bob Aubrey, please, sorry about that. <laughs> well, that's all right. um, it was like, it all comes together. But look, uh, I'm a journalist, always have been, uh, unlike Jose, who, you know, went on. Uh, I, I have no interest in politics except to tell you how I like the interface between holding power to account and kind of mm -hmm. being between the, the people who hold power and the people who deserve right the best of what their elected officials give. It is always good to talk to, to just say he's been quite consistent. I mean, I, if I go back to I used to ask him when he was still fighting for uh, he was still in the tripartite talks. Just I don't know if you remember this, you know, what are the principles that drive you? How do you continue to do that? Um, right. In the Philippines, I guess, in terms of what we have and what's at stake, I we are at the forefront of this, the impact of social media. 
in, in, right. in an election. Uh, part of that is because up until January this year, the Philippines has for six years in a row, Filipinos spent the most time online and on social media globally. You know, oh. so even, even when the Cambridge Analytica scandal happened, uh, right. the, the country that had the most fake accounts was the United States. But the country with the second most number of kind of corrupted accounts was the Philippines, you know, which the data was, was thrown out. Right. So um, in our case, our elections, it is existential because it also is emblematic of the battle between lies and facts. 36 years, and I know Jose would know this, 36 years after the people power revolt that ousted the Marcos family, Ferdinand Marcos, uh, in 1986, he was accused of stealing up to 10 billion US dollars, which was a large amount in that time period. Well, 36 years later, his son, his namesake, Ferdinand Marcos Jr., is now the front runner by a large, right. if you go by statistical surveys. Right. And part of, part of the reason that's happened is because social media was used systematically to change mm -hmm. history, right? To, right. to shift it. Uh, there's a great Milan Kundera quote, um, the struggle of man against power is the struggle of memory against forgetting. And now if social media, which unites all of us globally can change literally change our world it, it's like that movie inception if you guys remember yeah. that you know you go into the dream world to change the real world that's mm. so so our main ninth elections will determine how robust whether our democracy uh survives it will determine whether we win the battle for facts you know having said that regardless of who wins even if it becomes a, a new president mark boss i certainly hope as Jose said that he would bring the best, govern for the mm. people, right? But I am, I hope, I hope it's not true, but I need to feel hope from officials who will restore right. our trust in public service. And I would say that across the region, Myanmar right. was devastating to see. I had journalist friends in Myanmar uh, right. who were forced to go into exile. And it's not right. just that. It's the kind of, you know, you hope that what happened in in the Ukraine and in Myanmar doesn't happen in, mm. in our world today. But we all seem powerless to stop this kind of gr naked grab for power. Well, for Europeans, certainly the Ukraine war is, is, is also something that... Uh, uh, they never thought they would see uh, after the Second World War. So as a journalist, uh, you, the, the 2020 Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to journalists uh, because journalists have this ethical role for freedom as truth and freedom of speech. And uh, uh, do you feel that the role of journalists, which used to be uh, reporting, commenting, now is to uh, take on this battle for fake news, and uh, and how do you, how do you do that? And 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 how is media going to 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 be changing? Because social media is something that uh, journalists really don't control the way you do broad, broadcast casting. So, uh, what how do you see this role changing? Because you're sort of carrying forward the profession, right? Yeah, it, it already has, and I think it's it's uh, extremely you know. I said this in the Nobel lecture that the last time a journalist was given the Nobel Prize was almost 100 years ago, 86 years ago. And he languished in a Nazi concentration camp. He couldn't get his, his prize. So I think the Nobel Committee was just signaling that this is the kind of world we live in now where our democracy, which, you know, I became a journalist because information is power. Well, now this power is being turned against us. And it is requiring inordinate sacrifice from journalists just to hold the line, to try to hold power to account. I've gotten attacked. I have, uh, just say, I forgot to tell you this since we last saw you. Um, I had 10 arrest warrants in less than two years filed against me by my government in an effort to try to intimidate us to silence. So it, it didn't work. Look. I can go back, but I still see Jose here. So if it's okay with you, Bob, is it okay that I ask the question of 
Norbert, because this is kind of, of interesting if I, of if I ask it from just say. So this is from Norbert uh, Faguera from the Philippines. He said, there are two prevailing models of government, governments in Southeast Asia. One is to limit democracy like Vietnam, Myanmar, to some extent, Thailand and Malaysia. Well, I don't know if, if democracy, well, yeah, limit democracy control. The other is to increase democracy and the model is the Philippines. And again, I would say maybe not, but one, his question is, which could, do you think would prevail? And two, which is more fitting for Southeast Asian culture and society? Let's get the camera up. Yeah. Um, oh. Did we lose him? I think we did. We did just lose him. Uh, that, that could be because of time. It could be also because uh, they, they warned us that there was the, the, the internet in, in Timor-Leste still goes in and out. Or maybe uh, he just won. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so uh, uh, do you want to answer that, that question yourself? I mean, uh, you, you have your own views, right? I do, but you know, I'm I'm a hybrid, and this was the one thing I did right. forget to ask Jose, because in many ways he became a hybrid. You know, when yes. you move from country to country, kind of like you, Bob, right? Like when you when you move when you come from more than one culture, you realize that culture really isn't the problem. Right. It is to me in this in the question that you asked, it is about control, precisely yeah. that. Right. right. How much control does the government want to give to right. its people? How right. much? Because it's it's if you're the leader, kind of again the way you just say said it. If you're the leader, and you listen to your people, you actually mm. devolve control. You right. promise, for example, in in countries in democratic states, you promise to do what is best for the people, even if it is not what's best for you. Remember, right. these are the ideals and principles, and. I really want to be inspired by a leader who would do right. that. And I think that's a challenge. So the direct answer to your question, I think, Norbert, is that who made the military create a coup in Myanmar? Mm. That's a power right. grab. That, right. And power, it is always power and money. So mm. when you say the culture is that way, it is also the, it's power play in each of our nations and the maturity of the citizens in the democracy to demand better, right? Um, you put Vietnam there, Vietnam as well. So this is part of the challenge of ASEAN is that there are so many different types of governments. And now the challenge of the UN Security Council is that what happens when there are no common principles that they will fight for, right? So for in, in my case, I always say in the Philippines, Rappler and journalists have been forced to hold the line. Right. I was forced very early on to draw the line where on this side, I think we're good and you cross over, you're evil, right? I, that's how I kind of continue moving forward as a journalist. And I would, would like to believe our leaders in ASEAN would do the same and be held accountable to their people. The problem is the more autocratic you are, then the less accountable you are to your people. Sorry, I may not be saying the right things for ASEAN, Bob. No, 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 <laughs> absolutely. I, I want to come to some to, to the question of ethics, uh, sure. and 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 as as you mentioned, uh, this hybrid uh, sort of life where you're going from one country to the next. I mean, I lived in China before coming to Singapore. Before that, I lived in France for thirty years. Before that, in the USA, uh, you you come to 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 the point where you say, I cannot depend on my culture. Uh, or on the political system that I live to, to define what my ethics are. Uh, and you've lived uh, and, and worked in many places. Uh, how did you come to define your ethics? And how would you, how would you, you know, not just you personally, but how would you suggest that people who are interested in ASEAN as a region will come to whether that's possible to have a regional ethics? I, I, I had the question and I think we, we were getting towards an answer, but how is it possible to actually develop an ethical an ethic beyond just the culture and your, your political system? It's a huge question. I, I mean, the 
I'll start with the back end, which is, you know, ethics. Each of our ASEAN countries will look at this differently, but ethics are really, it's, I think a code of ethics is important. It's kind of like you can use religion in that sense, yeah. if you will. You know, Indonesia, the world's largest Muslim population. Right. Uh, the Philippines, Asia's largest Roman Catholic nation. Uh, for me personally, when I was very young, when I wasn't sure how to make decisions, I it, it's Matthew, um, the golden rule. Do right. unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's very simple for me. I keep it that. And then you be honest, right? The first mm-hmm. challenge is that you be honest to yourself. Um, the golden rule really works. Uh, our problem is, so one of the other things I really looked at is how there's this, there was a great study on ethics and honesty that was done by Dan Ariely in, in the, he's a university professor at Duke. And he said that everyone lies by just a little, but what prevents us from actually lying, what keeps us more honest is if we have a code, you know? So when I was in college, there was an honor code in the university I went to. In, in, in each of our countries, I hope it's the constitution, which oftentimes gets violated, but you know, for ASEAN, an ethics code would be incredible. Maybe some of the problems, for example, that we deal with, with say Myanmar or more autocratic states wouldn't be as difficult, but I'm not a politician. And in that sense, you know, uh, it's the reason why I don't want to be a politician. Also, <laughs> not that it's, it's tough. I, look, the last part I would say to that is, you know, Jose is waiting to hear, and he sounded, right. when he talked at the beginning, extremely fu- frustrated with the yes. politics, right? That, you know, it is, he, Shanana Guzmao, who I also knew quite well, also did call Timor-Leste as government now constitutionally illegitimate, right? So that's, right. but these politics, yes. I think governments really need, the, the, those, our public officials need to realize that their little power plays in the end, mm their struggle for power should not impede their ability to deliver what their citizens need. And I think, you know, the call of uh, Ramos Horta is really that we must continue demanding our rights and demanding good governance. You know, for the students, you've got to do that. All right, so to go back to your question on ethics, I should toss it to you because you've been fighting for ethics in ASEAN. You know, I am not certain what that is. And part of the reason I said yes to a conversation with you uh, in this in this uh, right. webinar is precisely because I don't think it's defined. So how do you right. define it, Bob? That was, that, well, that's, a, that's the very question. So let me give you a bit of background. This, this webinar was suggested by uh, Marzuki Darusman, who you know. And he's one of the founders. So we wanted to have an ethics committee that would be more professional for human development, which is already uh, human development professionals. uh, The the studies show that we've seen agree that ethics is the foundation. So that's that's what we're fighting for is that the way you treat people in organizations and particularly in business and companies has to have an ethical foundation. It's not just for the profit of the company. Uh, therefore, we wanted to go, and but he was suggesting we do something larger. He made an important point that in ASEAN, uh, the, the, the sort of assumption was uh, we will start to, to develop economically first, and then we can worry about issues of freedom, human rights, democracy. Uh, as, and uh, when you start to look at it, there were... Uh, uh, studies on this, even before the United Nations went in with uh, Amatya Sen, uh, studies coming from Southeast Asia saying, no, you cannot do one and then the other. Development means freedom. Development means uh, that, that, that people can determine the, the systems on the, that determine them. So uh, when I started to look through it, uh, I found that the, the first ethic that was really driving ASEAN as compared to the European Union, for example, uh, the European Union was founded and really started moving after the Second World War, which is we want peace, right. never have right. the Second World War again, which is why the Ukraine uh, war is, is, is such a reminder. But for us uh, in this region, it was, uh, it was the, the word merdeka, freedom, 
uh, it was the, the Tag Tagalog, Maharlika, uh, yes. which is emancipation from colonization. Colonization was the common uh, fact, uh, political fact and condition of people in the 19th century and before. And then suddenly that you could have a nation of your own that you could determine how you're going to look. That was the driving force. And I think that's what's led us to this ethic of non-interference is nothing is going to stop us from deciding who we want to be in our country. So no other country, neighboring country can tell us. But at the same time, this is why our second panel is important. ASEAN as an institution started to take on its second kind of ethic, which is uh, rules-based ethics, you know, the rules right. of order and, and, and these rules-based ethics, which is very strongly promoted by the European Union today, uh, is, 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 has been slowly and I would say more silently taking force because we've got a lot of declarations, et cetera. The difficulty is that different ethical values conflict with each other. Right. Which brings me to the third one, which is that how do you actually move a region into an ethical uh, constitution? And that's why we're having this conversation today is that uh, there is a third type, which is leadership ethics. And uh, the founders of, of, of the ASEAN countries were themselves ethical leaders. And they had writings and speeches, and uh, th that's really part of the history uh, for each nation. But today we have regional ethical leaders, and there are different ones. There are thought leaders, there are journalists, but there are those uh, I would call one category, small category, is what I would call the heroic ethically, ethical leaders. And who are they? Well, uh, an easy way to say uh, who recognizes them is to look at who won the Nobel Peace Prize. We have three in the region. One is in prison. One is poised probably to be elected as president and the third is you. So these ethical systems, the leadership ethics that is, is really criticized uh, uh, in the Myanmar case, for example, why cannot yeah. ASEAN wants to be central, but why, why can't ASEAN lead is, is conflicting with the other ethical principles. And the difficulty is that ethics is dynamic, it's historical, it changes. And what is the direction that we're going in really is the question today. So what do you think about that? Oh my can, gosh, can well, first, region, that's a lot. Can a region have ethics? Uh, I believe it can. I believe it is starting, right? I think it must, but it depends on the leaders. Actually, that's your last one is, you know, if we if the right leaders are in power, then we could have a golden age where, because actually, if you think about it, the other problem in the region is, and this is a, a problem that I, I used to jump country to country to just do stories on this. When you have endemic corruption, it inevitably leads to bad governance. Right. And, you know, that's what we, we've seen. Like, for example, uh, yeah. um, we've seen Indonesia. We've seen Indonesia grow, right, from the time of Suharto. So I, I came in and, and opened the Jakarta Bureau in 1995 to the time in 1998, when all of a sudden, end of nearly 32 years of Suharto meant that all it, the generation of Indonesians who knew only one leader then had a new president every year for right. four years after that. And that kind of dramatic right. change. And I guess, you know, in terms of what you said, I think that's why if you are a student watching, that's why you then have to take what are your, you know, think through your values because you yes. are the new leader of tomorrow. And if you don't see that the, the type of leadership, ethical leadership Bob was, was discussing modeled for you, you have the ability to become that. I think that's the other part that's, so, you know, you talked about non-interference, rules-based ethics, and then heroic ethic of leadership, right? Can we actually give ethics in ASEAN? Um, I've covered ASEAN since 1987. <laughs> and I have highs and lows with ASEAN, you know. Um, right. It hasn't lived up to its promise. The promise, you know, part of the reason it was pulled together was for economic gain, right. you know, for the region so that we could bargain better collectively. Right. But, right. you know, 
again, I'm an old journalist now, you know, and I can distill almost everything wrong into two words, power and money. Mm-hmm. And how do you put guardrails around the people who have that ethics, rules based, right? And that they themselves limit themselves because there is a greater good. And, you know, to, to talk that this is actually not just ASEAN, it's quite universal. The yeah. most powerful man in the world today, I would, I would venture to say, is probably Mark Zuckerberg because he has a platform that determines the facts. And right now they're tearing down facts, right? Because the the business model of Facebook is surveillance capitalism. It's taking all of our data. And many of you know what I, or how I talk about this, but let me go to one thing. Mark Zuckerberg, an American, actually says, you know, Facebook's um, mantra is company over country. Mm -hmm. So you go back, right? Why not country overcome? Why not the greater good? Why not enlightened self-interest? This Mm -hmm. this phrase from ASEAN in 1997, which was when Laos, Cambodia, and Myanmar were admitted as, and they made the 10 countries, um, that phrase of enlightened self-interest, I would like to think that's one way we can get to a code of ethics. But I'm glad you continue pushing forward. I think that's the other part that's necessary. So for the generation coming up, your challenges are harder than when I was your age because the world is more fragmented. Our region is more fragmented. And I would uh, I would posit that, that actually, even though, you know, Bob, you mentioned Merdeka and... Uh, that, that what we have in common in the region is a fight against colonial rule. Um, I would echo Chris Wiley, who was the Cambridge Analytica whistleblower. Colonialism hasn't died. It just moved online. Uh, yes, and that's another question is why is this urgent for ASEAN, in my opinion, is if you look, because you, you, you look at the world and you look at the, the rise of Asia, uh, and you see that the forces of the of this new Cold War uh, are centered very much on this region. Southeast Asia, Asia is either a market in which we say we're going to move in and we, they will do things our way, or we have our own ethical system and we say this is how to do things in, in, in our region. And again, I think that's easy to, to, to see in Europe because... They, they're very vocal about it and there's a lot of institutional power and we see this very, very much today in, uh, in, in, the words, uh, in the work of NATO and the, the, the fact that the Europeans are coming together. But we don't see, we, we, we need to see this urgency of we need to get our, ourselves together and to start agreeing as a region. Uh, because if not, then it's a divide and conquer uh, situation that we have, you just you just go for one country to the next, and then suddenly there is no region. And I think that 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 is actually a danger, right? Again, it goes back to leadership. Yes. Uh, look how Zelensky actually galvanized the free world, galvanized us, right? right? One man who was a comedian who played a president. Amazing. Yes. Uh, made us realize, made the world, actually captured the free world, the, right. what was left of the free world. And they overnight, what is it, like 27 countries then pushed out RT and made decisions that were quite far ranging that they could never have done before. Um, but Zelensky could have left. And yes, maybe of then everybody was did. expecting it. Right? Um, so so the, an answer to your question is I... I I feel like there are some codes, you know, for example, yeah. the, the, the Philippines is one of the first signatories to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Right. They've already been written, but to varying degrees, our nations, I think, retreat into arguments of culture. And, you know, for Norbert, who asked this question, part of it is having lived in Indonesia for a decade Part of it is having worked out of Japan and India and Korea. Um, in many instances, what social media has proven to us is that these differences of culture and nation states are far less important than what we all have in common, right? There are more than 3.2 billion accounts on 
on Meta's properties. Right. And the same operating system is manipulating all of us. We have right. the same biology. We have the same needs, the same urges. And, and I'll just quantify, you know, it's like uh, a biologist uh, named E.O. Wilson actually defined the greatest problem we face today as our paleolithic emotions, right. our medieval institutions, and right. our godlike technology. So our godlike technology right. is showing us that these differences of culture are sometimes used as excuses by leaders who want to retain more power. Devolving power is a difficult thing. Democracies are difficult. And I have tremendous yes. respect for, for the men and women who lead democracies because it really is a life of service. But I want to know that that is what is driving them, not power and money. Right. John, do we have, uh, do, Maria, do we have time for a couple of questions from the audience? I'm supposed to leave at 11, but yes, sure. I would one like question, to one question. John, let's go for a first okay. question if we can, if we can get it. Uh, we got one from go. Siri. Just, um, what, just read what's it your, out. What's your opinion on the role of journalists today and unequal coverage of war in Ukraine as compared to the constant bombing of Middle Eastern countries by U.S. and Israeli forces that received little to no attention? I think this is actually a very important thing to address because uh, we, because uh, uh, that is an important issue, actually. That I do you want to mention? Yeah, it's interesting. Is that question from Indonesia? Who who are you from? So Did that the... it's interesting just to hear because you know I can almost see which country. Right. So there are meta narratives in each of our countries, right? So is it is media? I think if you're talking about Western media, and this is you know I worked for Western media for two two decades, um, and and I we know uh, that that each of the media of each country tends to look at what is important to that country, right? And in and in many instances, part of the reason you have a BBC and a CNN or you know these global networks like Facebook now is because those were the companies, or in the case of BBC, it's the government because it's actually that had set aside the money. Those were the countries that had prioritized these things. And when I was with CNN, one of the one of the questions I always had was, you know, well, what about Asian views? What about, and the constant challenge for me was balancing, you know, a Western, because you need to kind of process what's coming from our country so a Westerner would understand it, and then vice versa, because because our countries have different uh, uh, cultures and narratives. So the right answer, I think, for you is the reason why Ukraine is a story, and I think rightfully so, not just for the West, but for all of us, is because it is the first time in, I mean, my gosh, imagine another nation coming in and invading another one, right? And so it's not only that, but it is also... Um, in my book, How to How to Stand Up to a Dictator, which is coming out in September, um, before, last December, I sent a draft and the prologue was about the annexation of Crimea, because okay. that was the very first time in 2014 where we saw globally two different meta narratives that has now just gotten worse eight years later. But it was also the first time right. we saw fake accounts coming up, bottom up. Right. These were now taken down by the social media platforms, but they were Russian disinformation that were seeding lies bottom up about the Jews in Odessa. And then, you know, a, a day later, the same narrative came from uh, Russia's foreign minister at the UN, Sergei Lavrov. So that was an example. Now, if the social media platforms did something eight years ago in 2014, yeah. would the world be where we are today? Would our democracies be as weak as they are today? I would posit no. But the right, so let me answer what's implicit in your question, which is that you think Western media hasn't quite placed enough uh, focus on its own conflicts that it is actually, you know, it has its vested interest, the US and Israeli forces in, in Palestine, right? So again, I, grappled with this a lot in while I was a Jakarta bureau chief. Um, and I think part of that is, again, if we get to a, a time, part of it is the length of time that this has been going on. 
So it's almost, it goes back to the old principles of journalism. Ukraine is brand new. It right. just happened, right? It's, it's mm. a little more than a month old. And then the Middle East has fractured in many different ways. It is, it is an ongoing, I mean, similar to our problems. Myanmar, for example, in its own right. way, you know, Marzuki Darusman led right. a UN team into Myanmar and yep. then Facebook itself sent a team yeah. into Myanmar. That's so right. I think I would just say, look at what's implicit in your question and go to what you really want to say, which is what I read in the question is that you seem to think Western media is, is giving uh, those nations a free ride. I don't think it's as much that as Ukraine is truly the focus of the world right now. Maria, thank you. Uh, One last thing before you go, since we have young people, and as you know, the ASEAN University Network are the the large uh, universities uh, in ASEAN. So here you have future leaders, obviously, future thought leaders, some of whom even on this team are thinking of going into journalism uh, and uh, are saying, can I ask Maria Ressa, where should I study or should I do this? What is, your, what is your advice on, on this ethics of freedom for, for the region of ASEAN? Uh, I think the two questions there, right? Should you be a journalist today? There is no better time to be a journalist, but there is no tougher time for you individually. This is a time when you will make a difference because journalism for the 21st century is being determined as we speak both in form yes. and substance, right? So that's the first time the journalism. Right. Right. I think the second one of ethics in ASEAN, it will depend on the leaders. It will depend on the leaders, right? And, and you, as voters, we all have some say in that. But if you're from, say, Cambodia or, or Vietnam, you know, your, your say may not be as much as, say, and I would even I would even question whether Filipinos we we have the right to vote, but our uh, our information ecosystem is now a behavior modification system. Right. So we have we lost our agency anyway. Sorry, I don't mean to take that's you an ethical that question. Absolutely, yeah. right, right. So free will is the basic question, right? So my advice is this: before you have to make decisions, figure out the kind of world you want. Figure out your own values. Just say, said this, what are you willing to fight for? What is important in your world, right? And then what you do is, you know, you begin to create that one person at a time. Uh, At the Nobel lecture last year, I said that because of social media, democracy now is a person-to-person battle for integrity, Right. right? It really is. And so the question for you is, where do you draw the line? You know, how well will you give up some of your power to others in order to have a better world? What kind of leader not only do you want, but what kind of leader do you want to be? And then please lead ASEAN and make us better. (laughs) We got to do better. (laughs) Thank you, Maria. It was great to, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, It was great to have this conversation. We hope to have you back again. Uh, We also know that uh, this will be uh, shown on Rappler as well. So best of of luck for for, for that. Uh, And uh, we're also looking forward to your book, How to Stand Up to a Dictator, Coming out now, it's finished. You, you finished the manuscript? Not Almost. yet. Uh, April 23rd <laughs> is my third draft, but um, it okay. comes out September 1. So okay. we'll be looking Good forward. luck. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you much again. for having me. Bye bye. Goodbye. So, uh, with that, we have, uh, we'll conclude the first uh, phase, uh, the first half of our webinar today. And we'll take a, a short break. Uh, let me hand over to John. Uh, what, how long is the break and, and how do we uh, organize this? Uh, well, uh, first of all, I'd like to, I would like to thank um, uh, Ms. Maria Ressa and His Excellency Dr. Jose Ramos Horta for coming today and answering all the questions from Dr. Bob and the audience. Uh, we are very honored to have all of you here and we hope that you've learned something new today. Uh, we are approaching our 10 minutes break for today. We should reconvene at around 
uh, 1025. So the break will be from 1015 to uh, 1015 to 1025. So yes, we yes, hope sir. to see yeah. We yeah, and come back, uh, when you come back from the break, we will have a, a fascinating uh, panel discussion. So it'll be in a little bit different format. Uh, and I think it will be extremely informative uh, with the specialists that we have, as well as the representatives of youth. So uh, we will see you in 10 minutes. I look forward to it. Thank you. See you.
Hello, everybody. We'll be uh, waiting for the rest of our folks to be coming back soon. And then we will be starting the next session with uh, three of our other speakers. So we'll wait for all the participants to come in and we'll start around 10.25. Let's see. I think some people are coming back. Okay, we have about a minute and then we'll restart the session. Uh, just a reminder, uh, the e-certificate will be offered at the end of the webinar, so please, so if you're looking for one, please stay tuned uh, until, yeah, so please stay tuned to the end of the webinar, and we will tell you how to get the e-certificate. Uh, also, if you would like to ask questions for our speakers, uh, please do so using the Q&A function, do not use the chat function. Uh, yes, please use the Q&A function when you're asking questions to all of our speakers. Uh, okay, I think we are ready to begin the session again. Uh, okay, everybody's here. Okay, uh, welcome back everyone. I hope all of you have returned. Uh, before we continue, uh, I would like to hand over to the moderator, Dr. Bob Aubrey, so he can talk about ECAR. Dr. Bob is the founder of the ASEAN Human Development Organization and the chair of the Ethics Council and advisory board for the ASEAN region. Uh, Dr. Bob, I hand the floor over to you. Thank you. Uh, so because um, we, we have a bit of uh, more time before this panel, I'd just like to remind you where this, these dialogues come from. So ECAR is a recent initiative uh, founded by three institutions uh, the ASEAN Human Development Organization that uh, uh, I represent, uh, and also uh, the Foundation of International Human Rights Reporting Standards that was represented, founded and represented by the chair, Marzuki Darusman. You've heard his name uh, uh, several times during our dialogue this morning. And finally, the host, the ASEAN uh, University Network, represented by Dr. Choltes, who is probably listening in, I, I got a message from him, uh, Dr. Choltes, the executive director, and this uh, fantastic team of, of, of people organizing uh, and hosting this, this webinar. This is our sixth one. Uh, we have them periodically, and we have covered uh, everything, uh, including uh, very delicate and uh, controversial issues such as freedom in ASEAN and the ethics of freedom. Uh, so today our big, our, our big theme is one uh, that we are uh, really uh, uh, planning to use as a, as a basis for, for content. And our second panel will take us forward on some of that content. Uh, over back to you, John. Can you introduce our panelists? Yep, uh, thank you, Dr. Bob. So yes, we will be moving on to our next session of the webinar. Uh, we will be featuring three speakers with expertise and interests in various areas of freedom of speech and human rights in Southeast Asia. Uh, we will first start with Her Excellency Yuyun Wayuningrum. Uh, Yuyun is currently the representative of Indonesia to the ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights. She has more than 26 years experience working with various human rights organizations. She is also the currently the International Democracy Goodwill Ambassador for the Korea Democracy Foundation. Next, we have Dr. Sudachini Hamili Siyai. Uh, Dr. Hamili is 
the lecturer in Faculty of Political Science in Chalonkorn University. Her research interests include digital politics, political communication, comparative politics, and democratization. Her previous works appeared in the Journal of Human Rights, North Korean Review, Critical Asian Studies, as well as other non-academic outlets. She also has worked with several bodies of the United Nations on human security and atrocity prevention. And of course, finally, we have our student representative, Mr. Vincent Carlo Legara. Vincent is currently a senior taking up ABMA political science at Ateneo de Manila University in the Philippines. His research interests include comparative politics, international relations, security, and popular culture. He is currently researching the 22 uh, 2022 Philippines presidential election for his graduate thesis with particular focus on popular and mean culture. We will first start with the presentation from our speaker, Her Excellency Yuyun Bayun Ingram. We are very honored to have her speak today. Uh, I will first hand the floor over to Dr. Bob Aubrey, who will be moderating this panel discussion after the presentation. Bob. Thank you. Thank you. So we have about 20 minutes with each of our panelists, which will allow them to go into their, to, into their areas. And uh, uh, the first one is very important because we're talking about freedom as an ethic in ASEAN, but freedom is also a right. And uh, ethics is about decisions and principles concerning right and wrong. Uh, freedom means that you do what you say or think. And the question now, now becomes, and we talked about this in the first part, is how is ASEAN evolve, evolving? And what uh, Her Excellency Union represents is a very important step that ASEAN has taken in terms of human rights. And so uh, we've asked her to uh, explain, uh, first of all, how this works and what is this institution uh, and what's going on. And then we'll, we'll come to questions and, and dialogue. Over to you, Union. Thank you, thank you very much for having me here. Um, I, it's very interesting to hear uh, some views from uh, His Excellency Ramos Huerta as well as from Maria Reza. Uh, now, as Bob mentioned, I would like to look at uh, freedom from the perspective of human rights uh, and, and what my organization uh, currently until 2024 uh, respond to the freedom at least uh, freedom recognize, uh, freedoms are recognized in the ASEAN Human Rights Declaration, Article 23 on freedom of expression and opinion, uh, freedom of uh, religion and belief in Article 22. But just to mind you that freedom is not absolute. Uh, it is uh, international uh, human rights law um, in general comment on civil political rights, the Convention on Civil Political Rights also mentioned that freedoms are not uh, 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 absolute. Uh, but the limitation of freedom can be done uh, with three uh, requirements. First, uh, based on necessity, legality, and proportionality. So during a pandemic, for instance, we have experience uh, how our freedom of expression and opinion, how our freedom of, of, of movement had been limited. Uh, some countries do it uh, properly, some countries uh, do, do it uh, with uh, impo by imposing the um, set of, of emergency law. So these are num there are a number of uh, um, differences on how, res how countries respond to the COVID-19 in relation to our freedom. Uh, but as long as they are uh, within the, within the uh, parameter of necessity, legality, and proportionality, uh, countries will be able to uh, be accountable to the people as well as uh, to comply with the international human rights law. Uh, but if you look at the, um, because freedom is also linked to the democracy, uh, I found this statistic, the latest one, the 2021 from the, the Economist uh, Intelligence Unit. Uh, there are a number of statistics, uh, survey uh, provided by different institutions. Uh, for this uh, uh, event, I would like to uh, pick uh, uh, the, the statistic uh, or the, um, of the view from the uh, Economist uh, in Intelligence Unit. Uh, the Economist defied democracy in the region, Southeast Asia, into two different categories. 
Uh, first is the flawed democracy in Southeast Asia, and the other one is authoritarian in Southeast Asia. The economists actually divide it into three categories, uh, fu uh, full democracy, flawed democracy, and uh, authoritarian democracy. Flawed democracy, according to the economists, uh, denotes that the countries have uh, fair and free and fair elections, and uh, but there are a number of uh, problems in terms of uh, weaknesses in governance, uh, underdeveloped political culture, or a low level of uh, political participation. According to the economists, countries such as Malaysia, Timor Leste, Indonesia, Philippines, Singapore, and Thailand are considered as flaw democracy in Southeast Asia. Again, they have uh, 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 they have a political system, but lack of political participation, lack of political culture, and there, there are a number of problems in governance. Uh, authoritarian uh, in Southeast Asia, authoritarian itself uh, uh, defined as, uh, uh, as you know, the authoritarian uh, state political pluralism is absent. Um, there, uh, election if they occur they are they are not fear or fair so you can see more on the definition uh, from the uh, the economists and the economists consider vietnam cambodia laos and myanmar uh, uh, under category of authoritarianism uh, authoritarian countries you can also see the parameters used by the economists include electoral process and pluralism functioning government uh, political participation political culture and civil liberties uh, next, please. Um, our challenges uh, to freedom uh, post-pandemic, uh, um, there are so many, but for this opportunity, for this event, I would like to pick on uh, this information. As you can see here uh, in the slide, uh, there are falseness uh, and intent to harm. Uh, in misinformation and disinformation offer the false falseness of the information, uh, but mal in, malinformation offer uh, both false falseness and intent to harm. So you can also, re I, I'm not going to read uh, uh, the definition because we don't have time, but uh, uh, just to build up on what uh, Maria Reza uh, discussed uh, this morning, uh, we are facing with fake news, disinformation, a fake account and so on and so forth. The implication of having this information, uh, there is an increase of suspicious distrust and then anger and then hate. And this is, uh, this is uh, the situation that we are going to uh, deal with if we don't do anything uh, today. Next, please. And uh, now, uh, 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 with the election, as we see, as we saw in 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 United States, in different countries in the region, now with the with the uh, Ukraine war, uh, we also see number of uh, coordinated efforts to provide us with different information. Uh, but in the in the in the in the world of uh, uh, um, discussing on freedom, especially on freedom uh, to in, uh, access to information, freedom of uh, expression, opinion, uh, we uh, usually uh, uh, introduce with uh, at least two categories, all misinformation and influence of operation. Uh, in, in Facebook, use this influence of operation with the term coordinated in inauthentic behavior or CIB. Uh, all in misinformation, usually the disinformation circulated by individual, but influence of, of operation or CIB uh, was rather coordinated efforts uh, to manipulate public discussion for a strategic goal. And they are professional, they are, they, they are professionally run, well-resolved and sophisticated operation and so on and so forth. And uh, the production of this information cons consists of uh, uh, the production of the information itself, uh, uh, actors uh, providing funds uh, to create um, uh, misinformation, disinformation, um, and then distribution uh, using uh, commonly using social media platform that enable the spread of disinformation very quickly uh, and consumption. The people uh, that read and listen to or watch the, the, the misinformation and then change their uh, uh, beliefs on certain situation. 
So it is very important for us to understand that what we read, what we see on social media, sometimes it is not like it is. Maybe we are guided, being guided into certain uh, uh, understanding. So it is, again, it is very important uh, for individual, for groups, for companies, for governments uh, to uh, educate, to be educated uh, on how to deal with information, how to uh, differentiate which one is uh, fake news, disinformation, malinformation, misinformation, or the truth. I think what uh, Maria Ressa uh, earlier mentioned about the integrity of the fact is very, very important, uh, especially in, in our uh, time now. So that's something that I would like to uh, mention uh, for now. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. And um, can you uh, bring us back a little bit in, in ASEAN in terms of institutions to talk about uh, human rights was, was one of the uh, debates uh, very early on, right? And it became a debate as uh, ASEAN enlarged because different countries had different constitutions, etc. cetera. Uh, ITER was, was created. How does, uh, what is ITER? How does it work? And what is your role as one of the representatives? Yeah. Um, first, uh, all constitution in Southeast Asia mention about human rights, except Brunei Darussalam. I think Brunei Darussalam recognized uh, right in terms of every citizen has right to believe on, on, on religion and the religious of religion of the state is Islam. Uh, but all constitutions, as you can see, uh, in, include uh, human rights. So human rights is not something new in, in ASEAN. Um, uh, the idea of developing uh, human rights, uh, regional human rights mechanism started in 1993 when uh, some ASEAN member states attended the uh, World Conference of Human Rights in Vienna. Uh, and then they agreed uh, to come up with the a, pro a, a proper uh, regional human rights mechanism. And then uh, civil society uh, in that time uh, gathered in the in the network called the Working Group of Human Rights Mechanism, based now based in Manila. They continue to engage with uh, governments of ASEAN uh, to push them to realize their promise uh, to establish a regional human rights mechanism. And then in 2007, uh, more and more civil societies, such as Forum Asia, based in Bangkok, I was part of the Forum Asia in that time, uh, also uh, did a campaign and lobby governments with uh, with, uh, with their own ways, because the difference between the human, uh, mechanism of human rights uh, based in um, um, Manila, or, or we call it the working group, uh, mm -hmm. they engage with the system, they engage with diplomats, they talk to diplomats, mm -hmm. but uh, Forum Asia believe that uh, people need to know, we need to create a critical mass. And that, that is why uh, Forum Asia mobilized a lot of uh, support, uh, uh, and um, doing the uh, capacity building uh, to make people uh, part, uh, to 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 gather people to participate in the process of campaign. And in two thousand nine, the uh, the body was established based on the Article fourteen in the ASEAN uh, Charter. So it's very it's very strong. It's charter based organization. Right. And so far in 12 years, uh, uh, ITER has been struggling to, uh, to, to do the work because as, uh, ITER was not established with a, a proper uh, mandate to protect. Uh, mainly the mandate of ITER uh, was to promote uh, of human rights. Uh, in that time, in 2009, uh, many, many governments are feeling uncomfortable and uh, perceiving human rights as very sensitive issue. Mm. Uh, after 12 years, uh, gradually, uh, ITER uh, come up with uh, ASEAN Human Rights Declaration, the complaint mechanism, even though this complaint mechanism is not mentioned in the TOR, the term of reference of ITER, but uh, in 2019, ITER agreed by consensus uh, to come up with the uh, uh, mecha complaint mechanism. And also in 12 years, uh, I joined uh, ITER in 2019. I experienced how difficult it was uh, to table on table issues because mm -hmm. uh, every time I talk about human rights, the country in concern will 
will reject and will block and uh, will use the uh, arguments either there are a number of variations. So first, they right. will be using uh, non-interference principle uh, as mentioned in the charter. Uh, second, uh, that we are family, we should not criticize each other. And uh, third, uh, the, uh, the, the assumption that if I, uh, the situation is already difficult, if I uh, 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 intervene, it, uh, it make the situation worse. So th the, the term is rather, uh, uh, don't jeopardize uh, right. the, 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 the situation is already bad. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so this kind of three variation that I always receive, but uh, in 2020, we managed to come with the consensus that we have specific agenda to talk about human rights issues without being accused of breaching the non by non-interference principle. Right. So we have done that in April meeting, in July meeting, November meeting, and lastly in March meeting. So. At least, well, uh, if you ask about whether non-interference uh, still becoming a problem, talk about human rights, because this is common common question I receive. Yes. At the moment, at the moment, we have uh, allocated a specific a space to talk about human rights issues, including on human rights in in Myanmar. Uh, right. But we we still need to nurture this. Uh, as a practice, because I believe in ASEAN uh, in general, we have to, at some point, uh, it is not a generalization, but we, uh, we, we should practice, practice, practice until, until all member states believe that this is something that they can do and this is doable and it can be institutionalized uh, uh, as a part of the um, norms uh, in ASEAN. Okay. Uh, two two quick questions, and then we'll we'll, we'll see what what's coming from the, the our, our listeners and our our, our audience. Uh, in ASEAN, you're an observer. You see closely what's going on, and ASEAN does have a, a declaration of human rights. Many people don't know uh, that, that 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 exists. So, in practical terms, in, in in other words, in in terms of the freedoms that people enjoy, would you say that ASEAN is getting better? That this rules based type of ethics is is progressing uh, or is it declining and then we talked about you mentioned Myanmar and is, Myanmar seems to be a, re, a, a real test case not only within ASEAN but for the external view of ASEAN why can't they why can't they come to a, a, an agreement uh, so is it getting better or is it getting worse or is it stagnating what's your what is your observation I think that's a very tricky uh, question. Uh, before ITER was established or before uh, the ASEAN Human Rights Declaration was adopted, uh, of course, we continue to see uh, here a number of human rights violations here and there, but not right. necessarily to the attention of, of ASEAN. Now, with these two norms and with these norms and uh, mechanisms, we, uh, we, we hear cases, the number of cases often than before. That's because, uh, I'm not sure whether this is declining or, um, or increasing, but now certain uh, human rights violations have a name yes. because it is mentioned in the ASEAN Human Rights Declaration. Before right. that, it was uh, dealt by uh, individual countries, but now it become a regional concerns. So right. uh, I, I see this one of the... Um, uh, advantages of be of having mechanism, even though mechanism now is very uh, weak, but now uh, we can gradually uh, frame the issue as a regional concerns. While before the establishment of ICER, we cannot because there is no mechanism, there is no definition. Yeah. But now we can, and I actually hope that more and more civil society, uh, young people like our audience now to submit their concerns uh, through the mechanism that we uh, established so we can hear more and more and we can discuss more and more. I think the digital, digital age now offer us with a new, perhaps with a new definition of what would be the state obligations, what right. are the rights and how violation can be happen in digital mm -hmm. world and mm -hmm. uh, in offline uh, world. Right. 
Well, that's that's encouraging. I think you've mentioned two things uh, that are important: is that IHR represents a space now of dialogue in which you can you can uh, talk about things, and it's also a language. So, if I take it, uh, if I make a parallel, for example, if you think of sexual harassment, if you don't have a language to say that's sexual harassment, and if you don't have a space in which you can discuss it or a mechanism in which you can raise a question then it just sort of disappears. It happens, but people don't talk about it and it's not, nothing, nothing can improve. So from that point of view, it seems that uh, there is progress thanks to Aisha. Is that, is, is, that, is that how you see it? Many challenges, obviously, but... Up to the people. <laughs> okay. uh, for, us, for me, it is my duty to continue to improve. Uh, but it is uh, up to the people, the people of ASEAN, how they perceive it. But again, uh, I do not have word for uh, uh, frustration. Uh, that shouldn't be my vocabulary right now because I'm yeah. in the position of uh, doing something. Uh, yeah. yeah, so it's up to the people how to do. Thank you, Yun. We'll come back with perhaps with some questions. So, John, may I ask if you have uh, any any questions from from the audience that you'd like to uh, raise to you and you, Yun? Yeah, we have a few questions from the audience, uh, and good. I think that some of them are actually like, we actually invite the rest of the panel now because I think they're quite general and it might apply to uh, some of you. So, um, so yes, uh, I'm going to... Uh, why, why don't we start to... with one from, from, from the audience and then we'll yeah, the yeah. jump in, right? Yep, so uh, for some of this, my, Dr. Hamily and uh, Vincent, you may want to jump in and make these questions. So, um, so one of the questions is how does... This flawed democracy, I think that refers to your presentation, Yuyun. How does this flawed democracy affect the political participation of the youth and students? And maybe it's one of you would like to answer that. <laughs> how flawed democracy? Yeah, can you, can you read it? Uh, okay. Clarify. How does flawed democracy affect the political participation of the youth and students? Ah, in... Of, of, in flawed democracy, I think there are a number of spaces that we can explore compared with the authoritarian system. Yeah? Uh, uh, and uh, I cannot make any generalization of what, uh, what, what the best, uh, but at least individual uh, uh, young people should be able to identify political opportunities because our situation is very different from one country to another. Uh, some social media are open, some social media in certain countries are closed and controlled. Uh, if, if, so if one, well, this is very classic, if one door closed and you should find another door or, or if doors are not uh, uh, available, you find window or whatever you can find. And, and, and that's possible. And uh, uh, like uh, even in authoritarian countries, I can see some young people use the existing opportunity. For instance, if it is not possible to talk about human rights and democracy, they talk about gender and development. And it is the case in Laos. Mm -hmm. I engage with a number of young, uh, young people and, and uh, organization in Laos. They use this, uh, this opportunity. Uh, there are num uh, what We talk about human rights and development very often inter interchangeably. And also on gender, uh, right. uh, on gender right. issues. Some uh, young people also use the right of person with disabilities because uh, the attitude of government is more uh, acceptable on this issue. So even in the authoritarian uh, countries uh, as uh, categorized by the, the economists, young people still able to find uh, opportunities or political opportunities and how they can explore uh, 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 possible freedom uh, in their own. But of course, the pace cannot be uh, similar with others uh, because we are, again, very different uh, from one country to another. But the skill to, to be able to identify political opportunities and what to do in that uh, political opportunities is the skill that young people need to have. Well, not only young people, everyone should have that. Right. Uh, we have other questions from the audience, but I think we, let me ask the panelists first, if you have any questions of Yu Yun before we go to our next panelist. So we'll go through the different panelists and then we'll have a, uh, come back to general discussion with some of the questions. Um, any questions? Dr. Hamily, Vincent, for Yu Yun, before we go to 
before we move on? No? Okay. Uh, thanks. So we have some other questions that we will not, we, we, we're not forgetting them, we'll come back uh, because they may be answered by, by some of the other panelists. Uh, so what we've seen now is that, uh, that, that ASEAN does have this rules-based ethic of freedom uh, and uh, and that it is evolving. And uh, there are a lot of issues as there are in any uh, part of the world today. Uh, but uh, it, it, again, the, the, the issue is what it is up to you to make ASEAN um, uh, better. But we're confronted with something that Maria Ressa uh, talked about, and we'd like to go in, a, in more of a deep dive uh, with our next panelist, Dr. Hamily, who studies this uh, issue of, of uh, social media. Uh, and it's not probably only about social media because it's about surveillance and all of the other things. Uh, and so the, the idea is that we were, are hoping that you could give us a picture of what's going on uh, and a picture of what's, what you're actually advising to, to students about what they can do about uh, social media. Dr. Hamley, over to you. You're on right. mute. So, yeah, um, thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Bob. So let, let me just start with kind of a, an overview, kind of the direction of digital politics and the social media use that we're seeing nowadays, right? So going back all the way to the early 2000s, right? When most of the social media platforms had just emerged, right? People were very powerful, right? With the role of those social media platforms in politics hoping that it would change the way that we interact um, in political sphere, right? For example, uh, Larry Diamond, you guys might have heard about him, right? He's one of the re most renowned political scientists, right? Even called social media during the time of its emergence as liberating technology, right? As a tool that he would hold that it would liberate societies, right? But fast forward to now, Right, a decade and a half, about roughly a decade and a half later, right? We know a bit more about the implication of the internet and online applications now, as they have penetrated basically every aspect of our lives, right? Um, including our political life. I spend, oh my goodness, so long uh, daily on social media, right? <laughs> so, and you guys too, I, I think, right? We, we spend, I think, at least six hours a day, I guess, on our phone, right? So it's so penetrative to our life, right? So it's, this is the era of digital politics, right? This is where uh, we start calling this time as digital politics, where politics is being digitized, right? From every key actors, from the citizens, civil societies, political candidates or to even governments are using the internet or digital technologies, right? Indeed, of course, right? As you, you guys probably already know as well that social media enriches the public sphere, right? It's making social movements much more easier to organize, right? However, one thing, and also Ms. Yu Yun already have mentioned this, fake news, right, is super spreading right now online, right? And one thing that we also need to understand in this platform is that how they work, right? They generate revenue through advertisement, right? So therefore they also run algorithms that group like-minded people together, right? In that sense, it's creating what we probably, you guys already have heard this term a couple of times before to echo chamber, right? They put us in this chamber where we only largely interact with people that who things like us, right? So instead of encouraging people to naturally socialize as the way we used to, right? Socialize with opposing opinions, talking to people who think differently, right? We are now being constrained in this chamber, right? And only exposed to people who think the same way, right? So in that sense, um, it also, although it enriches the public sphere, you know, strengthen the group, right, of the, of the like-minded people, but it kind of excludes the out-group, right? It's lowering our tolerance towards people who think differently, not only in terms of political ideology, but people who might come from different cultural background or social backgrounds as well, right? And this is one thing that is quite concerning um, in terms of politics and social media, because 
if you're having lower tolerance towards people who think differently, right? I think that is counterproductive to democratic values. So let's let me just open uh, like this first. Okay. okay. Uh, and, and, and Maria Ressa mentioned this sort of biological uh, reaction that we have uh, that, that leads to hate speech, right? So it's not only the echo chamber, but it's also the fact that what we talk about is not what we like. Uh, we talk about what we hate. Uh, yes. How do you study that? Um, I think it's also quite interesting because that uh, kind of runs into the issue of freedom as well, right? We talk yes. about um, freedom of speech and freedom of expression online, right? And where where we sh where should we draw the line? Right? I think uh, Ms. Yu Yun kind of opened this quite well in terms of how she summarized it, right? that freedom is not absolute, right? Freedom of, freedom of expression and freedom of opinion, of course, they are basic human rights, right? Regardless of space, that means whether you're offline or you're online, you should be able to exercise the same set of freedom, right? That said, there are limits to such freedom as well, right? For me, I think personally, your freedom ends where it starts to infringe that of others. Mm -hmm. I think that's my, that's my rule of thumb to start with, right? And Article 19 of UN Declaration of Human Rights actually prohibits hate speech and right. incitement of hatreds based on race, identities, and religious beliefs, right? So there are some sort of um, international mechanism that protect, you know, people from hate speech already. This is kind of want to mention it right there, right? Mm -hmm. So first thing first that you may notice though, um, not everything is hate speech, right? Like I mentioned, it's based on race, identities, and religious beliefs, right? Okay. As many people may have casually you see this online, people, everything that offend them is hate speech, right? This is just also another thing that I just want to yeah. mention that not everything qualifies as hate speech, right? right. Um, but now back to social media, right? The ability to rapidly spread the information, be it the disinformation, misinformation, or malinformation, or even facts, right? Making this platform very, very powerful tool, right? I had a talk. This is um, uh, anecdotes a little bit, right? I had a talk with this person who was in charge of a huge project on the U U.S. electoral election. I mean, huge, like in terms of the partnership. There are so many universities in, mm. involved, so many platforms, right? right? What they were doing is they have this capacity to track misinformation about the U.S. elections, right? And also quickly report to social media platforms who were also their partners. All right. And they said that the average time from reporting to the removal was about six to eight hours. Right. Imagine that they had that capacity. So imagine how far that Im information have already spread. Right. right. Six to eight hours. Millions of people have already seen that information and probably have already believed it. Right. right? But now that, that was election. Right. So the implications, you know, may... You know, you may just lose a, lose a seat, may not become president or whatever, but it's not as dreadful as the case I'm about to tell you, the Rohingya. Okay. Right? People hear about the Rohingya, right? Reports have come out that Facebook actually has played a key role in disseminating hate speech that causes the genocide against the Rohingya. Right. And this is fact. It has already came out, this report. You know, tons of reports have already point fingers at, uh, at Facebook, right? Mm. In fact, Facebook is now being sued for 150 billion US dollars um, class action lawsuits by the, the Rohingya refugee who escaped to the US and the UK, right? So the lesson learned here, I think, in terms of freedom on social media and, you know, the fine line of how it may spill over to become the hate speech you know, is that, um, you know, when freedom gets exercised, it's fine, right? But at one point without proper controls or regulations, like on social media, right? There's nobody to mm. really, you know, gonna hammer you or regulate your speech, right? Then it can have some serious consequences, right? Mm. For example, somebody, somebody may lose a seat in the elections, but right. somebody may actually die. 
right. right? So it's very severe. And even us as individuals, right, we need to be careful um, when, when we get online or we, you know, interact with people on social media in terms of how we can exercise our freedom of expression, our freedom of opinion without infringing others. Right. right. Yeah, so, so it's another tool, a very powerful tool of communication, but uh, it depends on, on how it's used, just as it used to be for radio or television and other, other, other media. But universities are supposed to be, uh, I mean, you're, you're teaching at a university, so obviously your students are learning how to deal with this, right? Uh, and education is very important. How do I actually deal with the ethics of freedom? My freedom doesn't, isn't absolute. I can't do anything I want. Uh, but isn't it a bit too late to start now that we've got the social media being used uh, uh, much young, uh, at a much younger age and uh, uh, very much younger age when you start to think of the, the use of uh, you know, phones, et, et cetera. So what, what should be done? When, how, how can we learn how to use this properly? Ethically, I would say. Well, Dr. Bob, you're, you're asking a college professor. So my default answer would be no, it's never too late. <laughs> right? You can start at the university. Right? But um, sensibly, I guess, to be fair, my answer would be yes and no. And here's why. So one thing, if you may notice, you know, if you, li- you, you let your kids, your small kids just hang out together, they're generally really nice to each other, right? And mm. they interact very well with each other, right? If you just leave them alone, right? right. But they're, for some reason, they're getting meaner and meaner and, as they grow up, right? So what's changed, right? What's happening, right? I think social surroundings and life experience can do a lot to people, right? And that said, though, I'm a firm believer that we should start educating about critical thinking, being good citizens, you know, being nice to each other through right, responsible communication since young age, right? Say elementary school, we should be able to start to, you know, um, incorporate critical thinking skills into the curriculum. Right. If we can start them young, being good citizen, being kind to people would come naturally to kids. Right. right. It would come naturally to them. They don't have to think twice when they act. Right. right. But however, if that works, right? let's say, you know, it's all nice and well and it, it's working in our right. favor. Right. How, then at that point, right at the university level, when they get to me, let's say, right. when the kids get to me, right, that's where we refine the edges, right? We kind of, you know, fix the rough edges a little bit. College kids are at the age where, when they're able to grasp a little bit more, well, a lot more, hopefully, than when mm-hmm. they're in elementary school, um, more complex concepts, right, about right. truths, about logics, and also about ethics. Right. right. So it's a good time. That, that's when it's a good time to build up on a more robust um, critical thinking skills and responsible communication. So it's never really too late to learn something, I think. And, but starting them young is, is the key, though. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so uh, you're saying it should start in school. And uh, do you know of any uh, experiments or research that's being done in ASEAN schools at the, at the age of elementary school, uh, middle school, high school, uh, for being able to use social media? And are there also organizations that are helping people to use this uh, in in the right way? Um, I cannot speak of the ASEAN context. Maybe uh, Ms. Yu Yun can can jump in on this. But to be honest, I'm just observing my niece and nephew. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, they're, they're better at those devices than I do. You know, they, right. my, my four years old know how to get onto his Zoom classroom by himself on his iPad. I mean, <laughs> they were born like holding right. those devices, you know, those digital devices. So it's quite amazing. Like for right. um, the digital native, right? I, I like to call them digital yes. natives. Yes. You know, their issue of navigating... Um, social media is not, it's, it's different than our generation, right? Mm-hmm. 
um, sometimes we have constraint or we have um, we have constraint of not being able to use device properly. You know, you can be like, um, I don't know how to use this. So I mess up a little bit, you know, but those kids don't have that excuse excuses, right? They know how to use the device. So what we need to fill them in is actually the critical thinking or or the way that they can process information, right? right. Because Believe it or not, well, Dr. Miss Yu you know, also mentioned this, right? There are tons of information that come through social media every minute of every day. The information, the amount of information is so overwhelming. It's a lot more than what we ever been exposed at mm -hmm. any point in time, right. right? So it's very important to teach students or kids, you know, starting them young, how to process those information. Right. And it, it's a little bit different than what we used to um, maybe during my time or your time. Of the box, right. And as an expert, I, I assume that your that your belief is that it's just going to get more complicated. There's going to be more. Oh, yeah. Uh, do you have yeah. any evidence of that? I mean, uh, what's what's what how, how what's it going to look like in, in the future? Five years, 10 years down the road? Um, I think no concrete evidence just speculations right and i yes. think we all probably are seeing the same thing it's getting a lot harder to um screen out misinformation and disinformation yeah. right because the technology that they are using is getting a lot more sophisticated um you may have heard of like deep fake video mm -hmm. or deep fake images right it's what, getting is, what is it what is it please deep define fake. yeah so um it's what is deep fake it's the sophisticated version of photoshopping the image or the video, right? It's making it um, a lot harder to, to identify the fake images. Right. And sometimes it can also be AI generated as well. Right, right. Yeah. So uh, to, 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 to wrap up on this one, uh, uh, what, what should people do? I mean, if I say I want to, to, to be able to use social media, but I want to use it ethically, I can't uh, filter out all the fake news. I can't filter out everything. I can't go back and, and not use it. Uh, so how can I use it ethically? What's the, what's the advice that you would give to-, to What I usually, them? well, what I usually tell my student is to be vigilant, right? So I, I am teaching a seminar in digital politics right? Right. and also democratization as well. So the two things kind of merge, right? But we cover a lot of topics on um, social movement and also um, political communication, right? right? So we cover things like um, the effect of social media, right? Echo chamber, like I told you, filter bubbles, stuff like that, right? So they they already know this, right? So they all they have to do is to be vigilant, to be well aware that we are in this bubble whenever you get online, right? right? So just because your view is supported by the people in your circle doesn't mean that it's correct, doesn't mean that it's accurate, right? So in it's, terms an, of information, it's an applied form of critical thinking in a way, isn't it? Yes, yes. So just, just need to be a little bit more well aware of your surrounding. I guess, see, when you, when you, when you teach your kids, right? When they go outside, be like, hey, you know, know your surrounding. Don't don't get too focused on your phone or whatever you're doing, right? right? Or you will get kidnapped. It's basically the same thing, right? Tell your kids to be well aware when they're online, right? In terms of information consumption, you said that you know there are tons of information on social media. It's just really tough to filter out. But I still encourage them to at least before sharing anything, right? Do more research and fact check. Thank right, you. Before, before, you know, sharing any, any content, right? Because they yeah, know I, that I fake news is, is uh, they know that fake news is the problem online, right? So I tell them, don't be the problem, <laughs> <laughs> right? Don't, don't create the problem, right? And lastly, on the, on the freedom of expression online, yes. which is also something that we're talking about, right? Freedom. And you, you have freedom, like I mentioned, but it ends when you start stepping on uh, other people's toe, right. right? So what I tell them is don't say anything online that you wouldn't say to people's face, mm -hmm. right? Or something that you know, if you say it to their face, you get punched in the face. So don't do that, <laughs> yeah. right? Okay. Right, and 
So as and also a little bit on the time spent, right? Because uh, Maria Ressa also talked about you know people spend a lot of time on social media too too much time on so social media. I think there's no too much time. I think you can spend as long as you want on social media online, as long as you're aware of the virtual reality of it. Okay. Know that it's not real. Thank you. Uh, John, do we have any specific questions for Dr. Hamley or are the questions more for, for the panel uh, in general that we can wait until uh, after? What would you say? Okay, uh, we have a few questions as general, but I think that we have, we recently got one that's quite recent. Okay. Um, I think it's from, uh, it says, what would social media look like in a full democratic society? How would you ensure restriction from racist and harmful right-wing ideologies from inciting further violence in the real material world? Oh, this is the second question. Is it possible the vague definitions of democracy makes it difficult for youth to be critical of the current system of use of media manipulation under the pretense of free press? Okay. It's a long question. Oh, uh, yeah. It's a long question. question. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me pick up a part of that. Uh, is that... Um, uh, do do you think that 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 media should be filtered? Because uh, isn't isn't the problem that if you start filtering it, you're going to create a, 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 a its own problem? Um, I think my question is filter by whom? Yes. What's your right. recommendation? Yeah, I think I think the big question here. Uh, Again, yes and no, because I'm a political scientist, so I'm gonna be diplomatic. I, I'll never give you a straight answer, right? <laughs> but see, the big issue here is who is gonna do the filtering? Who's in charge of the filtering, right? Because if it's filtered by, I don't know, third party, right? Who, once again, who's that third party? It could right? be the government. Could be, yeah. Absolutely not the government. Okay, right. right? Okay. But I think I can I can read the question here so I can probably quickly answer this. Um, yeah. What would social media look like in a full democratic society? It will look just like this. Mm -hmm. It will be no different, right? <laughs> and how will you ensure restriction from racist and harmful right-wing ideologies or also um, out left as well. I mean, it's it, the other extreme is also right. quite equally dangerous. Yes. Like right. Um, I think quickly to 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 this point because I think it it, it ties into quite well one of the points that I also want to uh, express is the fine line of the legal status of social media, and I'll go through this um, really quickly. Right. So. One thing that has been a debate for quite a while in terms of social media is its legal status, its ambiguous uh, legal status, right? Are we treat, should we be treating social media as platforms or publishers, right? Because it will plays into how we can regulate those uh, companies as well. So let, let's start a little bit from why this is a complicated matter, right? Two things here, legal responsibility of the companies and transnationality in nature, right? So first, these companies, right? So first platform and publishers have different legal obligations. You guys know this, right? Particularly in terms of content ownership, right? So while platforms do not have ownership on content, right? Um, therefore it cannot regulate or gain revenue from, from the contents, publishers do, right? Social media companies like to call themselves platforms because they claim that they do not earn revenues from contents hosted on their platform at all, right? The, rather, they earn money from advertisement through user information. Mm -hmm. So that's what they said, right? However, we have seen cases where contents were removed from a platform for violating community conduct, right? So how can social media companies regulate content like publishers, right? Without carrying the same legal responsibility to one. Right? right? So that's number one. Right? Number two is the nature of this company that make the regulation really difficult. As we know, there are, these are transnational corporations, right? They're based in one place and they, they um, operate everywhere else in the world, right? So which country's law should apply to them, right? right? 
Not to mention that they operate online on the internet, right. which, by the way, there's no law to regulate internet either. Mm -hmm. Not even a set of international laws up until now. Right. So it's 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 a it's a wild west in here, right? <laughs> in, on the internet, right? So right. what we see is the efforts instead of the government to control the online content in their own country, which may vary from places to places as well in terms of stringency. So I think that kind of uh, answer that question is who, who, who should filter the content, right? right. Who, who should deal with content? So we ended up having the governments doing it because the platform cannot do it. And okay. you know, there's no regulation on it. Very, very good point, very good point. Thank you. Do the panelists have any questions for Dr. Specific for what Dr. Hammerly has been saying before we move on? Yu Yun. I, uh, I do not have a question. I just would like to add uh, yes. the answers from Dr. Hammerly yeah. on filtering of press. Yeah. I personally against uh, censorship, uh, especially from the press, but I think this is very important always to go back to the classic eth ethic of journalism, uh, right. being clear and uh, always uh, double check. And it's very important to uh, to uh, to have this as uh, the principle for, for, for journalists, which is free from fear and favor. So the favor itself, uh, perhaps this is something that uh, what Dr. Hammerly mentioned about filtering by whom, because that's mm -hmm. actually serving certain interests. Yeah. And uh, so I think this is uh, uh, this this is very classic, but still very uh, has be in this in this in this digital age, it's becoming more and more important than before. But I I have a problem with the way some journalists uh, write, especially in online platform. Uh, very judgmental sometimes, um, right. opinionated, and, and they are looking for clickbait because they mm -hmm. want to uh, more people to read. So sometimes right. like uh, reporting uh, sexual harassment against girls or, or, or women or even men, um, it's more, rather the, the, the title becoming very judgmental to the victims uh, just to get uh, people to click that, uh, the link. And I think this is something, this is writing style. This is nothing to do with the people, but, uh, but I think uh, uh, the quality of uh, journalists and also uh, it's very important to improve uh, the quality of journalism yeah, so in our region. It's as if there's no ethics for journalism. The professional journalists uh, like Maria Ressa, who was at CNN, et cetera, would have been trained uh, on what to say. But you've got uh, many of these uh, broadcasts, webinars, et cetera, that are, are, are no, no better than hate speech. Good, very good point. You agree with that, uh, Dr. Hamily? So is, is, should there oh, be yeah. an ethic for those? Should there be some sort of ethical code or should there be ethical training or what? There should be. We're using that freedom, right? See, I'm, should, I'm, just, anyway. I'm, so, I'm such a party pooper because I'm like, yes, there should be, but who's going to run it? <laughs> I actually want to jump in for a little bit because it's actually related to one of the questions from our audience, which is, I want to know the insights on how you differentiate between hate speech and legitimate criticism. Mm. Is that a question for me? Sorry. Uh, that's I, for I, all of you, actually. Uh, well, like, uh, yeah. maybe. Okay. Is there, is there a specific definition of hate speech? Yes. Is, is it defined by the United Nations? You, yeah. you said that, right? Yes. Yeah, there you go. Ms. Yu, do you want to jump in? <laughs> The UN strategy uh, and plan of action on, on head speech uh, in 2019 actually provide uh, a definition. Well, number of institutions provide uh, uh, provide a lot of in, uh, in, uh, definition, but the UN through it, the strategy and plan of action uh, mentioned that um, the at least there are four uh, category four elements that may uh, uh, meet the criteria of head speech. The first, it is uh, all kind of communication through speech, uh, writing, or uh, attitude, uh, yeah, attitude, mm -hmm. uh, or action, uh, with the intention of attacking, using the language that is uh, uh, what is uh, degrading, Degradatory. degrading, yeah. Yeah. degrading, and discriminative, mm -hmm. and it uh, address certain groups or certain right. people. Uh, based on who they are. 
whether they are coming from a certain religion, certain ethnic group, uh, race, uh, uh, color, uh, um, skin color, uh, or uh, descent, or um, um, sex, or other uh, identity. So okay. there are four elements that can fulfill the criteria of uh, hate speech. At least that's for the UN. Thank the you. Country. Thank you. All right, let's let's move on. I want to get to Vincent because uh, we, we'll, we'll be coming back to some of these speeches. Thank you, Dr. Hamerly. So, so diversity is a traditional zone of freedom. Uh, in fact, if you look at uh, universities, the, the police, uh, most universities actually have their own police force because they want to make sure that, uh, that uh, city police or state police do not interfere with this freedom of expression because the university is seen as being some uh, a place of, of sanction where not only can uh, professors study what they want to study, but also students can be free to sort of experiment with, the, with free speech without being uh, too limited uh, uh, and, and being harassed particularly. So as a student uh, leader, uh, you've been a student leader at Ateneo uh, University that's in Manila, in Philippines. Um, you've written uh, quite a lot and you've been quite active in, in many of the student uh, movements. Um, uh, you wrote a paper on Myanmar, for example. You've written a paper on uh, non-interference. Uh, but as a student, first of all, um, you also represent a what we're seeing as one of the founders of this ECAR uh, dialogue, which is the, the universities themselves. Uh, what is the state and the ethic of freedom for students? So over to you, Vincent. And okay. Well. Yeah. So definitely uh, with regard to freedom of speech in universities, um, students are surely worried um, about preserving uh, freedom of speech, not just in universities, but also I guess in the larger scheme of things, right, in ASEAN. Um, I would like to take note that uh, the rise of populism, as what Ma Maria Ressa said earlier, and illiberalism in Southeast Asia, right, they have led to crackdowns on free speech and also on the free press, more importantly. Right. Um, you also have targeted disinformation campaigns that aim to drown out dissent and what is true. So if you, if you check on social media, right, uh, let's say whenever... Uh, someone has an event or a webinar or releases a statement more often than not right in um, countries with very um, active well you could say very, countries where this information is very ripe uh, you have troll armies and coming to you know uh, right. precisely to troll you know post whatever content they can in order to drown out I guess um, right. whatever the speaker is saying um, but I guess going back to like the university aspect, or I guess yeah. to the lower level, like the school aspect. Um, I also note that, you know, students at a young age, like when, since they were like kids or elementary school, right? Uh, they have been taught the concepts of human rights. So this, is, this includes free speech and how important these rights are to a free and functioning and by extension, a democratic society. And, you know, as, as these students grow up or like as we become more mature, uh, we become more exposed to social reality. Uh, we become more aware and we begin to better grasp how rights are being curtailed by state forces and you know, how these impacts can be far-reaching and long-lasting. And I think once uh, students begin to see how these processes happen, right, um, they realize that there is a message or a narrative that is being sent you know, to stay in line or face severe consequences, basically. Uh, right. We've seen that in many Southeast Asian countries. Yes. And um, I think here, students can really see the disconnect like, you know, between what they have been taught, the ideal society, right? Like, you know, a society which respects human rights and free speech versus what they currently see. So the crackdown, right? Extrajudicial right. killings. I think mm -hmm. this disconnect is what pushes them to fight for what is right. And we can clearly see that across the region, right? Like a lot of student-led right. movements, especially in universities. And the universities stay true to their reputation of becoming, you know, the bastions of truth and mm -hmm. free speech. So, right. yeah. 
So let's talk about ASEAN. Uh, one, of the, one of the advantages of, of social media is that the students can communicate across borders yeah. uh, much more easily than before. And we've, we've seen this, this movement called the, the Milk Tea Movement, which was quite, uh, uh, quite remarkable during the Hong Kong uh, you know, umbrella, uh, uh, what they call the umbrella revolution. Uh, in which you had students supporting and 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 communicating, etc. With Myanmar, this again came to the fore with uh, people communicating using social media, going around the the, the blockages, uh, and and so as you say, uh, Vincent, the, the, not only are the our campuses uh, the bastions of truth and free speech, but they're also a way for students to network across a region. Mm-hmm. Uh, what is? Can you tell us? What you see as this this networking? What is the ethic that's going forward? Is there some? Is there is there really a movement of students for an ethic of freedom that you see uh, going ahead? Yes, definitely. Um, for social media platforms, right? Um, it cannot be denied that they really increase real life political engagement, especially among the youth, uh, especially in the younger generations. And it's wonderful that we get to interact on a wider scale and reach a large audience. And it's easier for us, right, to organize and coordinate because there are platforms that help them achieve this purpose. The potential and impact of digital politics is clear, especially among the youth, right? Although, as Dr. Hamily discussed earlier, there is the real possibility of unknowingly falling into echo chambers. And as such, uh, there is a need to complement social media efforts with underground initiatives and I guess I'd like to note that, you know, with the social media efforts that the youth have been uh, undertaking, it is really possible for online political discourse to become increasingly polarized and hyper-partisan. Um, I think one of the most popular cases well, outside of Southeast Asia would be the United States, right? You have the Democratic versus Republican yes. <laughs> split. Yeah, and I very, think very. with this increasingly supercharged uh, social media climate, right? Our ability to re- to listen to people will be very essential as we try to navigate these spaces. And I guess with the ethic of freedom, especially for the next generation, I think younger generations highly value the notion that freedom and by extension democracy is something that is quote unquote informed, right? As what former President Jose Ramos Horta said earlier, democracy is ultimately a contentious process that is always being negotiated. Um, Essentially, uh, not only should we want democracy, but we should also proactively choose to democratize. And more importantly, I think the next generation's idea of freedom and democracy is something that does away with the ideas of elite and patronage politics, right? They are sick of empty promises from politicians, but reforms in governance only for the same politicians to continue using the political system for personal gain, right? Like, especially now. We have numerous, well, we have elections in some Southeast Asian countries, my country included. And we see it all the time, right? The usual script, you know, like they, they promise right. good governance, they promise um, democratic changes, but pretty much things, you know, say the same, you know, it's still status quo. And I think um, many in the younger generation are like sick of that. And for many of them today, like a quote unquote veneer of democracy is just something that simply won't do. And that there must be genuine and meaningful social political change. So let me ask you a question, and I'm going to reveal my age. I'm, I go back, you know, 72, 73. This was a this was a historical period, 1968, in yeah. which there were student movements uh, worldwide, uh, and uh, I was I was very much involved. But we, in at least in the United States, d- did not worry if we were in prison that we were going to be in prison for 15 years. And, and uh, that, you know, all, all of these things that would happen, that can happen. The, uh, so social media can cross borders mm-hmm. into your power, but the actual uh, <clears throat> ability to advocate and to uh, even organize uh, across borders in ASEAN, do you see this uh, going? In other words, is there a sort of mismatch between the ability to communicate and the ability to act, to take ethical action? Mm. Well, on that question, I do definitely see that there could be possible mismatches, right? Especially, I guess, with the way social media is also designed. 
um, I think Dr. Hammerly also touched on this earlier, but I also remember, you know, taking one of my political science classes here in school. Sure. Um, one of the final papers we've written for our for that course is, you know, about the algorithm of social media, and that you know, I guess under the old global governance paradigm, that you know, um, the irony of social media, especially contemporary social media, is that um, the algorithm seeks to there's that possibility for the algorithm to divide and put people in echo chambers instead of you know the other way around like uniting them and so i think i guess in order to address this mismatch right uh, there needs to be an uh, an overhaul of of social media like you know a social media that really eliminates these barriers and um i guess you know uh, this social media should not contribute to wealth um you could say the new liberal political climate that has been prevailing not just you know in southeast asia but also across the world like and it doesn't help that you know in many countries um state forces have also been taking steps to you know curb the use of social media which uh well especially when it comes to like I guess political mobilization and political organization um it makes it harder for people and especially activists to coordinate and and sadly, uh, this has also driven many of them like to use other platforms, like underground platforms, I guess. So there's definitely a, a mismatch. Um, and, you know, this is something that is, you know, very alarming and we need to address it. Thank you. Well, I'm going to uh, stop the, 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 this, the, the, the dialogue with me uh, now because I'm sure we have a lot of questions. Uh, if we start to bring together what our three panelists have been talking about, uh, a lot of these issues come up, and I'm going to uh, ask John uh, to to ask uh, uh, the questions that, uh, again, uh, one of the panelists may, may, may begin, but the other panelists can jump in. So these are the, the general questions that have been asked by our audience. John, over to you. You're on mute. I apologize. So uh, we have... Surprisingly, we only have a few questions. I would like a bit more. So, uh, by the way, uh, to our audience, please feel free to please uh, put any your questions into the Q and A. We have time for those. Um, so, we have one of the questions. I might actually paraphrase this, yeah. um, and I might put it in the chat as well. Uh, how can we form an institutionalized solution to combat misinformation and disinformation on both a domestic and regional level? Okay, uh, let me begin with with Yuyun because you're you're the, you're our institutional person, right? You know how the institutions work, uh, and uh, it might not be an ASEAN institution. We're talking about the government, etc. But uh, uh, yeah, that's a very good question. Maybe you can begin with that. Please go ahead. So. Um... Because of COVID-19, so the, the discussion on digital transformation becoming uh, very, very strong in, in ASEAN and also uh, ASEAN member states, uh, they come up with a number of initiatives uh, such as the well, digital transformation as a name is already occupy a number of uh, documents and initiatives. ASEAN now has the um, uh, digital governance. It's like a house. Uh, right. if, well, I have this PowerPoint presentation on this uh, to explain how how uh, how fast ASEAN uh, pick up this uh, particular uh, initiative. I, ASEAN also talk about uh, industrial revolution 4.0 and now 4. Mm -hmm. whatever. Now already 5.0. I I even cannot uh, catch up with this. Um, the ASEAN Comprehensive Recovery Framework uh, for. Uh, uh, for uh, uh, COVID-19 also mentioned very specific on digital transformation in all broad strategies. So uh, this is very, very important uh, 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 entry point for ASEAN to move forward to realize the community. Uh, but from the perspective of, uh, of uh, uh, ICHER, um, these all initiatives have been missing one point, which is perceiving this as human rights either right. as the right of individual or to identify that obligation uh, in relation to uh, digitalization. So this is something that is uh, not there. Um, yeah, so, uh, so that's uh, uh, from a regional uh, perspective at the moment. 
Uh, did anyone want to jump in, Dr. Hamily or Vincent? Yeah, yes. Dr. Hamily. Um, I think I can pitch in on the domestic level real quick. I'll tell you two contrasting cases, I guess, um, in terms of institutionalized solution to misinformation, right? So Taiwan actually has one uh, fake news center, right? They, they established this fake news center um, to kind of filter out the misinformation and the way it works is, you know, people report something that they think might be fake. It could be political, it could be non-political, right? It can also be like health, re health related um, misinformation as well, right? Say like, you know, pork lard can prevent cancer, it's stuff like that, right? right. Um, but it can, it can be anything, right? That people think it might be fake. So they will send it through um, the fake news center and the fake news center will actually send this information to corresponding ministry to respond, right? Then they have, they, I think that I believe the model is that they have 24 hours to write a statement to clarify that information, to, right. to actually flag whether or not it's real or fake, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it actually has been pretty effective in Taiwan. And a lot of countries have picked up this model and tried to replicate including my country, Thailand. We mm -hmm. also have anti-fake news center. I'm okay. smiling because it's quite funny <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, they said that you know, they, they are using this fake news center um, mainly for health related issue and also natural disaster issue, right? So if there's a, you know, false right. alarm in some of the tornadoes or whatever, right. um, then they can flag that. Mm -hmm. But what's happening is we're starting to see a lot of um, involvement in terms of, you know, flagging things as fake news uh, after the dissolution of the Future Forward Party, right? Uh -huh. And it's getting a lot more political. And I think the two contrasting thing that we can see from the Taiwan model and the replication in Thailand is the, first of all, the issue that they are dealing with but also the credibility of the institution. I think it's quite important as well, right? Because people, I guess people in Taiwan has more trust in their government than Thai people do, right? Mm -hmm. uh, on our, in, in our government, right? So when Thailand actually launched the anti-fake news center, literally people are laughing, like really? Yeah. Like yeah. Thai government are launching right. yeah. anti-fake news center? When hmm. when we all know that you're you're like the 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 mothership of fake news, really, right? right? So see, I, I think this is also quite important when we are trying to put through something, even at domestic level or regional level, right? Credibility of the institution or the in initiative is quite important. So sometimes having the government taking up this responsibility, be it mm -hmm. through you know goodwill or not. Right, it, it's it's quite iffy, right, in terms of the the credibility side okay. of thing. Right? So it may take third parties for it. Uh, to work. It's very instructive. And Vincent, did you did you want to say anything about this? Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Okay. Um, for yeah. the domestic level, and I, well, I'm not sure how this can like translate to the regional level, but also like over the past months, I've also been reading. Um, like I guess on troll farms and like you know how this information campaigns are being organized and um, reading some articles like from uh, various uh, academic sources um, the trolls that we usually see in like our Facebook posts or in social media are often the ones just doing the grunt work so right. you know when you decide to report them or you know you mass yeah you mass report them and they end up getting banned chances are they'll probably just come back under you know under the guise of some different identity. Um, more likely than not, there are, well, as based on what I've read, there are black PR firms, quote unquote, ready to, you know, shell out or deploy all these kinds of fake news and disinformation. And I think on the domestic level, you know, this is something that definitely needs to be addressed. So I'm not sure if all Southeast Asian countries have like uh, passed legislation like combating fake news, but Maybe, you know, in the future, should there already be like a bill or so, maybe this can be included to include like these actors, not just, you know, the grunts doing the dirty work, basically. But I guess on the on a more fundamental level, you know, in, in trying to address like this post-truth era, as many would call it, right? 
uh, I think revisiting the current political climate and the prevailing political culture, I think this is also necessary. Like, we ought to ask questions as a society if these dominant values that we see in social media are mm-hmm. the ones that we think we should put premium moving forward. So I guess there also needs to be like an internal reflection on whether or not you know these principles that sadly many of us are espousing are really these the ones that you know we'd like to pass on to future generations. So I guess okay. that's also a point to like mull about. Thank you very much, Vincent. So I'm looking at the, the, the clock. We have time for one more quick question. By, so the question could be quick, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, invite, I'll invite all three of our panelists to, to answer, but we'll, we'll keep it to, to, to the, about five minutes uh, in, in total. John, over to you. You're on mute. You're on mute. Oops, again, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so I think we only have time for one question. I'm sorry to the audience. Um, so I, again, I think I'll paraphrase this one. Um, at a societal level, what sort of media literacy should individuals adopt to not be susceptible to disinformation? Or maybe at the individual level as well. Can you, can you read it again or paraphrase, uh, make it clear? Yes, uh, it's in the chat as well. So at the societal level, what sort of media literacy should individuals adopt to not be susceptible to disinformation? Okay, let me uh, lead off with Dr. Hamley on this one, if you don't mind. So you're giving me tough questions. Yeah, we throw the tough ones at you. Actually, that's not true. (laughs) You even have some very tough questions too. Well, yeah, but... um, (laughs) I think it also depends on how you would define media literacy as well, because it, I think it goes hand in hand with uh, what Ms. Yu Yun also discussed in terms of um, journalist ethics as well, the, the, the journalism uh, ethics as well, because uh, this is really tough, <laughs> because I'm, tra- I'm trying to disentangle uh, yeah. the media literacy from like regular literacy, you know, yeah. because because that also linked to um, critical thinking. Exactly. Right? So what yeah. I, th- I think the way I'm gonna go with is that, um, you know, the three things kind of ties together. It goes hand in hand. I think if you have critical thinking, which I, I already posted that it, you should start, you know, at young age, teaching them how to think critically it's not that hard to build them up to understand the underlayers of journalism, right? It doesn't have to be anything complicated. You don't have to be a journalist, a, a journalism major to understand this, right? Teach them about logics, about things that they need to understand, what the media usually do, what's, right. what's their job, right? It, it is their job to sometimes make things interesting to sensationalize things a little bit and make things uh, in this, the digital term clickbaity, right? So that people read. So as long as people understand that and can read through that without bias, uh, it's again, tough to say without bias because people always have bias, but kind of try to try to also navigate through your own bias as well, your mm-hmm. pre-existing belief. I think, um, I think that's quite uh, acceptable at the societal level if we can collectively do that and be responsible with our own, um, you know, right. behavior. So, so you're saying that education has to start much earlier on this area and, and probably it's going to have to start really being a part, an obligatory part of education uh, starting at, at, at a young age, right? Yes, of course. But it doesn't have to be complicated, right? It, it, yeah. We just need to start from the basic and build the ground up. And like I said, yeah. at the university, like university level, we're just fixing the edges. Uh, you do? Would you like to say anything? I agree with, yeah, I agree with Dr. Hammerly because uh, this continue to evolve. There is no straightforward answer right. which one is the best. It's always evolved and we need to continue to uh, to monitor this. Uh, as you know, like many social media platforms like Facebook, Twitter, they continue to revise, uh, modify and uh, uh, make it better on their stand- uh, community standards because right. it continue to evolve. Something that 
uh, we do not see in the past as sensitive now become very sensitive. Right. So um, and and like uh, Dr. Hammerly mentioned about the faith, uh, deep faith. I think uh, we have that uh, uh, sample uh, just uh, uh, recently. Uh, someone make the AI of the uh, uh, President uh, Vladimir Zelensky as yeah. if they are talking to us. Uh, right. So, so if you if you do not question everything, you mm -hmm. will be able to agree on or to follow uh, on that kind of uh, 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 image in your right. uh, screen. So it's very very important. The critical thinking is very very important now, and. Uh, because this question relate to the previous one, so it, allow me to add more. Um, like Vincent mentioned about uh, law and regulation, yeah. in in one of our meeting in ICER workshop on freedom of re freedom of expression opinion, some member state in ASEAN come up with number of laws, but because they want to respond, but the law is not the only res uh, res proper response, because if we are not careful about this, we may uh, rather restrict freedom of expression or opinion. Now governments around the world having a similar challenge how to balance between restriction and, uh, and, and freedom itself. Uh, 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 some governments use rules, regulation, and so many things, uh, but uh, it is common in all member states right now, I see, they increase the quantity and quality of uh, digital literacy. Mm -hmm. uh, some basic, some cannot catch up with the, uh, uh, the development and modernity, but uh, they are doing something uh, in terms of educating their citizens. Um, um, NGOs also come up with a number of initiatives like uh, fact-checking, especially during election. They, uh, we will see in our social media number of pictures with the stamp, this is fake news, this is, you know, so many things. So it is not only uh, government doing it, but also uh, civil society. But the question is about the standards, which standard they use to say that this is uh, fake news and that, uh, and this one is uh, uh, fake news. Um, especially a government representing certain political uh, uh, position that's becoming uh, questionable by many civil society right now if uh, governments uh, uh, did that. In ASEAN, there is a declaration and framework on how to deal with fake news. Uh, I forgot to mention this. Um, it means at the regional level, the concerns of our fake news already recognized. They come up with a framework, mm -hmm. and but it is up to countries how they want to implement uh, right. this uh, a framework. Okay. Thank you. Vincent. Yeah. Um, about that question, I also think that um, it's also important that, um, well, I guess especially in the formative years, right, I think there's also a need to revisit the curriculum, especially for, I guess, kids and, you know, check if um, the history education as well as you could say government and politics education that they receive is more than adequate. Um, I guess I'd like to use the Philippines as like an example, right? So you have, uh, you know, martial law atrocities here in the Philippines, which date to like, uh, over 50 years ago and you know given the current state of our elections here well um someone well the dictator son is currently leading in uh the presidential surveys right and um i think we can see there um how i guess it's easy to fall for i guess a lot of misinformation and a lot of lies you see on like, let's say youtube tiktok and all these social media platforms if um uh, the history education that has been taught is not enough. Like there have been complaints over the years, especially with the education department here, that um, the information regarding martial law atrocities, you know, they were not really well detailed. They were not well documented. And of course, you know, as people or as these kids mature um, into into adults, not having this solid grasp will make them more susceptible. So I think also having a strong foundation as well of politics education, like you know, not not just let's say martial atrocities, right? But you also have let's say you know when politicians decide to do something crazy, or you know when they decide to do something that is obviously wrong and I guess obviously illegal. I think having this a more solid political education at a younger level uh, will 
I guess also help these kids or like teach these kids to be more as what Dr. Hamily and Dr. Yoon said, right? Be more critical at a younger right. age. So I guess there needs to be a revisiting of you know school curriculums, especially for formative years. Right. right. Thank you very much. Well, uh, we're out of time for our panel. So uh, I'd like to thank you all very much. We can continue. Remember that we'll be getting the recording. I'll just conclude by uh, making a, a few remarks about the theme of ethics of freedom. Uh, <clears throat> we started out uh, with the first part of our uh, dialogue uh, with a certain type of ethics, uh, which is the, and, and the, we intentionally invited uh, leaders and these are recognized leaders by a Nobel Peace Prize, which means that they have actually done something extraordinary and uh, not at all obvious to defend uh, uh, freedom, human rights, democracy, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, journalism in, in the case of Maria Ressa. What they were talking about is it, it's the, the importance, of particularly Jose Ramos Horta, uh, who, who uh, is in the election today, is the importance of democracy for freedom. And so the, there was a long discussion about the importance of being able to uh, uh, manage the, the democratic institutions properly, which is why he's running again. Uh, Maria Ressa talked more about uh, the journalist, uh, journalistic ethics for freedom and how important it is, and that that is another form of leadership. And that uh, her analysis of social media is that ethics is really individual to individual now with, with social media. But that uh, is a good example of the ethics of leadership for ASEAN. With our panel, what we've talked about, and starting with uh, uh, Yuyun uh, and Aichur, is uh, rules-based ethics. So we're talking about human rights. And <clears throat> what was important, I thought, was that we can start to see that the evolution of ASEAN in terms of this rules-based ethics is positive that there's a space to talk about human rights uh, and that there is a, a language of human rights that's being created. Of course, the questions of how it's applied uh, and where it's applied and what needs to change in order to be effective is, is something else. But uh, that brings us to a third form of ethics, which is called res results-based ethics, uh, which means that you take a medium like social media which can be neutral in a sense, uh, and you start to shape it in such a way that the result uh, gets, uh, the, the result brings something that is potentially very unethical. Uh, that's the <clears throat> questions that we have. Hate speech, politics, <clears throat> influenced by media, this echo chamber effect that you mentioned where it's very difficult to get a diversity of point of view, uh, and uh, the, the case that you gave uh, with the Rohingya. And with Vincent also, in a sense, uh, uh, results-based ethics, which is what is actually happening in the student world and, and freedom of speech, where you have these crackdowns and you know, political engagement across ASEAN using the, the, the tools. But where I think we all agreed in the questions that you answered and asked um, was that uh, in terms of democracy, what we need is to be able to begin with education at a much earlier stage to be able to equip people uh, for how to deal with these new ethical challenges. And uh, in ASEAN, it would be uh, great if we can start to have further cooperation uh, uh, across ASEAN in terms of how this education uh, will we'll, we'll be able to take place so that, so that we can start to develop more of a society and culture, which is in line with what we have been talking about in the third pillar of the ASEAN social cultural community. So again, I'd like to thank the, the panelists. I'd like to thank again uh, our AUN team for doing such a great job hosting this. Uh, thanks to our first speakers who are no longer with us, but uh, check the results for the Timor-Leste uh, um, education and, and, and check uh, the, the, the news for the uh, September uh, book by Maria Ressa on how to uh, uh, deal with a, with a, with a tyrant. Uh, so I'd like to turn this back to the AUN team for the concluding remarks. Uh, right. Uh, thank you, Bob. Well, uh, I was going to give you <laughs> the clear remarks, but I think you said all you have to say. So uh, thank you very much, Bob.
Um, anyway, but I also like to thank all of our speakers for the question and for answering the questions given by our audience. And uh, we hope that this entire discussion has enriched your understanding about freedom of expression and human rights in Southeast Asia. And yes, yeah, so um, I think we could, I think that's the end of the webinar. So uh, thank you to everyone who's joined us today. Uh, we will have a recording of this webinar uploaded to the AUN Secretariat official channel. Uh, AUN Secretariat official, that's the channel. So you can watch this session again. For the audience, we would also like you to fill in our post-event survey with the link in the chat for Zoom and YouTube to receive a certificate of participation. It will greatly help us with the organization of the next webinar. Uh, we'll leave the screen up for all of you. Uh, we are expecting to organize more eCar webinars in the future, so please stay tuned for our announcement. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon. Cheers. Thank, Thank you. you.